we've got apologies from Camilla, who is not well. Um, I think everyone else is here, aren't they? Everyone else is here? Good. Everyone happy with the minutes? Good. Um, there aren't any matters arising. Sorry, I think Anna. I was here. I seem to... <laughs> <laughs> you think? I think so. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure I was here. I mentioned in the minute, so I think that probably means I was here. <laughs> yes, I, I was here too. Yeah. Oh. Prepare your presence, continue. Thank you. Oh, are you not on the... Li oh, well, that's a bit odd, isn't it? Oh, you're right, you're not here. Yeah. Right, and Michael was here as well, so can we <laughs> insert them in, please? Right, David, your report, please. Um, thank you, uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, so this is largely an update report, um, so I'll do it at some speed, David. So um, as it's been consistent over the past few months, I'm giving an update on recruitment of inspectors, and as of uh, Friday... Uh, week, um, we'd made 256 offers against the target of, uh, or the objective of 300 inspectors by the end of April. So it, um, I'm reasonably confident we'd get there or thereabouts on that. That leaves a further 300 to be recruited during the course of the year. And um, um, a number of changes have been made which are also reported in this uh, note on the systems and processes we've got in place to ensure that we are um, in a good position to continue to recruit. So that's uh, good news and congratulations to the recruitment team in um, HR for uh, the way that they've worked to secure that but also uh, colleagues in the inspection directorates who've done the interviewing and um, uh, gone through all those processes. Um, Similarly, I'm updating in relation to the progress of the uh, academy and the offer uh, around education and development, particularly around uh, new regulations and the methodologies which are essential now um, and are all in from the 1st of April. So it's um, important that all of our inspectors are actually um, equipped with the knowledge of what the new regulations say and the new systems and processes. And this is the vehicle that we're using um, to assist that. But the significant uh, issue in this report is to update you following the last conversation we had on safeguarding. And um, I, I might just spend slightly longer presenting this, David, in light of um, the concerns that we've had. Uh, I gave an undertaking at the last uh, meeting to convene a meeting of senior colleagues. Uh, that meeting took place a couple of weeks ago. And uh, what this report does is update you on uh, the developments that have taken place. Key point here is that um, CRM, uh, the Customer Relationship uh, Management System, was designed to be an audit trail of actions taken. It was designed before the KPIs on timeliness. And what is now clear is that it's not possible to report timeliness in what effectively is a record of action taken. In addition, some of the actions can be completed within 24 or 48 hours, but a significant number of the actions can't be completed in the uh, 24 or 48 hours. So it was never possible uh, to get uh, to the target of 95% of actions completed within 24 and 48 hours. Um, more time will be taken uh, to achieve some of the actions which are required following those alerts. So what we've set out in the report are some of the immediate changes that are being taken and the change to the way that we will collect the data on action taken following both alerts and concerns. And thus uh, the um, data template is set out on page four of this report and you can see there's a, a number of actions which we are proposing to collect but also but to collect that by um, the date uh, on which it's taken and entered into CRM. We took a, the executive team yesterday the first of our monthly reports with this data populated 
and um, it will be reported to the April board meeting. And the proposition is we'll take three months worth of reporting uh, to ET and to the board and then set the appropriate performance expectations based on that data. Um, and then on page five, we're just setting out um, the further actions that we're taking in addition to this uh, to support these changes which are uh, taken. Um, so um, a key point of this is that um, training is offered to all inspectors in relation to the way that safeguarding um, concerns and alerts should be recorded on the database and how this new approach can be supported uh, in practice. These uh, workshop seminars commenced in uh, the middle of March and um, some other systems changes are set out there. Uh, chief inspectors uh, are uh, reinforcing these messages through their management meetings and uh, their colleagues are taking them forward through management meetings as well. So I think what we've got is a, a, a number of uh, systems changes and uh, management action and some training and development activity taking place. So um, I hope that gives a fuller explanation of what we're doing to address those issues. Okay. Thanks, David. I'm, I'm really glad we're, we're getting to grips with this. Um, I mean, one sort of related issue is, um, is, is us being able to describe what our role is and isn't with regard to safeguarding, because there's quite a lot of confusion out there. And I know it's related to um, how we respond to concerns, but I think safeguarding is an important subset of that. So I think we need to be you know, once we've got all this in place, we need to have a way of, of clearly communicating to um, services and the public about what our role is, you know, in safeguarding. And I think um, also I believe in, in the CARE Act, there are strengths and arrangements around safeguarding, which I, mean, I don't know if it has particular implications for us, but obviously we need to be aware about it. Um, so, so, yeah, the main issue is being able to articulate what our role is, because there is a lot of confusion. Really um, but important point. So, um, so the CARE Act puts uh, local safeguarding boards on a statutory footing. So that, in a sense, raises the status, uh, of, in my view, of safeguarding adult safeguarding boards. Uh, children's safeguarding boards are already in that position. So it gives an equivalence, in a sense. Um, so the implications of that for us um, are, are to reinforce the importance of this work. Um, we get invited to attend safeguarding boards and um, there are issues about should we be there permanently, should we be there when there are issues relevant to us and uh, we'll settle those. But the update in this report, Kay, is um, on those urgent actions that we need to take around the data. There's a longer term piece of work which is overseen by the safeguarding committee which Sally Warren is chairing which is addressing those bigger issues around definitions, uh, how our role fits with other roles that are taken and um, I, I, that, that work is progressing very well. Sally's uh, doing I think a very good job in relation to this. But your point about definitions, this is an issue I would argue that's not been settled in the best part of a decade. And I think the significance of that is it's not for the one to try. And I think this is just a very difficult, oh, she's here. Uh, this is a very difficult issue. Um, as, well, Sally might want to say something about the work we're doing on the longer term work, David. Is, rather than me put words into her mouth, which I frequently do, she can put words into my Thanks, Kay, for, uh, for the question. So Dave is absolutely right about the longer-term piece of work. And as I see it, I think there's kind of two phases of that longer-term piece of work. There's something we can do quite quickly about just being really clear about what's our policy about safeguarding, where we can articulate what's our role. And our role is really to be saying we're not there to investigate individual instances. That's the role of the local authority. But we are to make sh there to make sure that people take steps to make sure that person's immediately... Um, their risk is minimised, the risk of harm is minimised, but also then it becomes a really important part of our intelligent monitoring to understand where is risk and where should we be inspecting. So we're looking to be able to create that new policy framework over the next kind of couple of months, and I can uh, give the board a more detailed timeline. There then is a broader piece of work, as David suggested, where we need to be talking to the sector about really what's safeguarding, what's genuinely safeguarding and what really is about poor quality care. And in all three sectors, we've got a slightly different approach 
in a different set of behaviours. So in adult social care, an awful lot of things are put into the safeguarding procedure because there isn't really any other procedure, whereas in uh, primary medical services, it's probably that we're under-reporting on safeguarding um, because it's being considered through other routes. So we need to be thinking in, in all three sectors that we work in, what's the right set of behaviours we want to encourage through safeguarding versus poor quality. So both of those pieces of work continuing. Um, and the, the updates from uh, Andrea, um, Steve and Mike are here. Um, the new methodology is being rolled out now. More and, Each week, more and more reports are being published using the new ratings, and um, each of the updates provides the figures, even since last week. Uh, I think in, in Steve's case, I think there's a further 93 reports been published on dentists and um, uh, general practice which update those uh, figures. Um, worth just pausing on the work, uh, again, that Andrea's overseen, and she may want to add to this in terms of the registration project, and it's the first time we've provided a fuller update in relation to the progress that Andrea's overseeing in relation to registration. Hugely important part of our activity. And... Um, what this is setting out is um, the programme of work which is being put in place to oversee the review of our registration functions given the changes that have taken place to the legislation and uh, the way that we uh, are operating. Uh, I'll pause at that point if there's any questions on <coughs> any of the three update reports. Yeah, uh, my, my question is, um, it's to do with registration but it's also to do with um, the reference to um, Stephen Bubb's report mm -hmm. on um, not registering models of care that um, don't deliver good outcomes um, and I know we've we have have done that but it also kind of um, raises the issue that it's likely that there are services that are already registered <laughs> that are not providing um, the right model of care and I'm not suggesting that we can go around just closing places down, but I wondered if, if any thought had been given to that um, and, and whether, you know, maybe having a clear trajectory <laughs> could help sort of focus minds, because I know there's a sort of frustration in some quarters that um, the post-Winterbourne work hasn't um, been as, as quick as, as uh, most people would like, um, and I just... So I just sort of wondered whether um, there was a role in us, for us, to, to have a kind of trajectory when we perhaps um, maybe deregister might be a bit of a, a strong word, but I guess that's what I'm saying. You know, say for example, in two years' time, we will we will deregister such such services, for example. Thank you, um, and thank you, Kay, for the um, uh, for the question. And, and, and um, Mike might also might want to comment from a hospital's perspective because I think it cuts across um, uh, both of our areas of responsibility. Um, so I, I'd say two or three things. Um, the first is that you. Know, from a registration point of view, what we're, at, um, what we're focusing on is making sure that that truly is a robust and rigorous test and is looking at the quality of service. So using our five key questions that we're using in inspection to really get us to drill into um, the uh, services that people are proposing. And I think that um, some of the due diligence that we have done in some cases recently and uh, the questions that we've posed about um, what the quality of care is going to be and the um, appetite, if you like, from commissioners in terms of commissioning those services um, has been an important part of the decision-making process. So I think that that's a, a good and clear thing for us to continue to do. And as we've said in the paper, we'll continue to work with um, uh, colleagues in Paul's directorate in policy to make sure that we can articulate that as well as we possibly can. The second thing, then, is what do we do with those services that already exist um, and uh, we might have concerns about? And again, I think that our new approach to um, 
inspecting services, not just looking at whether they are compliant with regulations or not, but looking <coughs> at whether they are safe, caring, um, effective, and um, responsive to people's needs and well-led. And I particularly think that in these areas, the answer to the question of whether a service is effective um, um, and whether it's responsive to people's needs are the two areas where we can get into the issues that you're, um, you're, you're um, driving at, Kay, because some of the models of care that um, do exist, you actually, they're not, we know now they're not as effective as they could be, and they are clearly not as responsive to people's needs as they should be. Um, you know, putting aside all of the issues of safety and, uh, and caring, um, which are, are fundamental too. So I think that we can use that. I'm not sure that it would be reasonable or sensible to be saying there's a you know a, a timetable by which we're going to have deregister because actually you know, we need to have a firm and solid and I'm sure Rebecca would be um, keen to make sure that we had a, a proper legal basis for doing all of those things um, but I think that we do, we can through our inspection signal um, uh, what it is that we're expecting and set those expectations as high as we possibly can um, uh, for the benefit of people who have every right to expect a service that is modern and up-to-date um, so I think that that's the way that, that, that we, we can look at that. And Mike, I don't know whether you... So I was, yeah, go on, Mike. In short, I agree with Andrea. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah. you, you know, and I think that is, that is entirely the approach that we have taken uh, in the hospital's directorate. I suppose Calderstones was the most obvious example where there were those outsiders who thought we should have gone further and should have closed them down. There were lots of other people who said, actually, um, we were too tough on them or whatever. Um, I think we got it, got it right in the middle. But I hope, genuinely, that our reports, because they do look at safe, effective, caring, responsive, well-led, will be useful to commissioners mm. and deciding where they need to go. Yeah. Sorry, Kate, can I just add to, um, just three things to what Andrea and Mike have said? Um, there is a compact which um, Norman Lamb has overseen because he's championed this issue, um, I, th I think, with some, um, some passion. And um, I think what that does is it draws in uh, NHS England, CCGs, um, to give uh, local authorities to give undertakings about what they will do from their commissioning responsibilities because all, all these services, that, uh, yes, they are registered, they've been commissioned by somebody, somebody's buying them. None of these will be private payers, they will all be using public money. So I, th I think the issue is to ask between commissioners and providers, uh, and indeed professionals, um, who have decreed that those placements are appropriate, many of the people in Calderstones would have been assessed by a psychiatrist who said this is an appropriate placement. So I think we need not just to look at what we will do in relation to this, but what others do to discharge their responsibilities. And I think what Norman Lamb has been trying to do around the compact is say, uh, actually, there needs to be a role played by commissioners, professionals and providers about the appropriateness of care. And I think that's important that we play our role alongside that. And I think um, Mike's articulated what we did in uh, Calder Stones and um, I think the story about when we didn't register an assessment and treatment centre because it wasn't commissioned and we didn't think it appropriate is an example of what we can do. <clears throat> but I think commissioners need to step forward into this space in a way that hitherto I'm not sure they have done. Um, there is a review of all 3,000 people that are placed in these uh, placements taking place, a named individual review, which I think is key to actually driving this as well, which might give you the timetable over which there can be some clarity about the appropriateness of placements or otherwise of individuals. Uh, I think the other thing that we've done uh, within CQC is this week we've uh, put in place some coordinating arrangements. So. Uh, each of the three inspection directorates will be reviewing uh, a contribution either through adult social care, primary medical services or the hospital directorate to uh, services for people le learning disabilities. And um, we need to make sure we're joined up. So um, I think we've agreed that Paul Elliott will chair a meeting that brings together people from across the organisation to make sure that we're acting more uh, in a more coordinated fashion than uh, we, may, we might otherwise do, so that we've got a consistent narrative uh, across the piece. But the key point I'd want to land in terms of your question, 
in addition to Mike and Andrea's, is um, I think this is a bigger commissioning issue than it is a regulation issue. Um, on a different issue, can, um, can I just ask Mike for an update on um, Bart's and Whitscross? Cross, a, a very high profile uh, report uh, in the, uh, hit the media, and, and with, with some features that I think it's worth commenting on. Uh, um, you might want to comment generally on what's happened, but, but a, a, a very large trust, obviously, on many sites, um, possibly a sort of imbalanced trust in the sense of some sites being more powerful than others, you, one could argue. Um, and then there was the timeline, the sort of warnings of... Uh, uh, inadequacy in some units, which obviously didn't have the desired effect. I just wondered if you could reflect on, on what this might mean for our processes. Yes, certainly. Uh, um, Lewis, as you'll probably remember, we first inspected um, Bart's Health in its entirety uh, <coughs> at the end of 2013 as part of our first wave. We did not rate uh, the trust or the, the individual services at that time, but we published a pretty hard-hitting report uh, then, um, and uh, I was at the Quality Summit at that time, uh, where all the CCGs um, and local authorities and the Trust were present. I think there were 77 people there at that Quality Summit, um, and it, it was we, we pointed out a whole lot of areas of poor care. Um, then, at the end of last year, there were rising concerns about the Whips Cross site, um, so we went in there as an individual uh, location, um, because um, obviously it takes quite a, a resource to, to go in uh, quickly, and we felt we needed to go in quickly. Uh, you've seen the report for the Whips Cross location. Uh, it is... A, a sorry report in many ways in terms of um, the amount of inadequate uh, care that we, we found. Um, and uh, the, the fact is that there has clearly not been progress uh, over the, uh, the past year. Um, we then brought forward the time of doing the rest of the inspection of Bart's Health, particularly the two other acute sites, Newham and the Royal London. That is still going through our process at the moment, so um, we would... Uh, anticipate publishing that next month um, but, uh, but so the, the inspections are complete but the report is not yet um, but on the basis of the Whips Cross site alone uh, I felt that we needed to bring this to the attention of the, the Trust Development Authority um, and I <coughs> wrote to David Florey asking him to consider urgently uh, whether the, the trust should be put into special measures um, on the basis of the Whips Cross report alone, and he, just, he agreed that that was a sensible thing to do. So, so that's the, the sequence of events, and we will publish the rest of the Bart's Health uh, report next month. Uh, so I was also asking about whether the, some of the features of that trust uh, um, carry any g more general messages for, for what we do. So well, the size I, of the trust, the yeah, multiple sites, uh, the delays and uh, improvement. Okay, uh, it, it is the largest trust uh, in the UK by by turnover, uh, well over a billion pounds, um, and uh, we have. We, we're obviously now beginning to get experience of, of, of large trusts versus smaller trusts. I don't think we're quite at the point yet where we can make any definitive statements, um, but we have seen uh, a number of trusts that are, uh, that cover at least three sites. Very few that have three uh, A&E departments, and so are three acute sites. I, I, I think um, Bart's Health is the only one that we've inspected. I'd have to go and recheck that. Um, so I think it is new, uniquely complex in, in that in that way uh, and in in, in size. Um, but uh, we have found a number of other sites, as you will know. Um, Morecambe Bay would be one in the past. Um, United Lincoln would be another. The Bay, East Kent would be a third, um, which are three site trusts, which are um, which we have had to recommend going into special measures. So um, th they are difficult. Um, I think time will tell whether they can be turned round, and I am hopeful that they may be. Um, so, uh, but I do think Bart's is a uniquely difficult one because of size, and particularly this three year ME uh, factor. <coughs> But do you think, Mike, I mean, if you take a um, look at Heart of England, for example, and now look at King's, you know, two other hospitals where they've done these sort of shotgun mergers, if you like, not been a success. I mean, well, is this an issue that... 
Well, we need to, to wait and see. I mean, not, not, I mean, at King's, we know about the financial issues. What we are, uh, we will be going back into King's very soon um, to do a formal uh, comprehensive inspection, both of the Denmark Hill site, the original King site, and uh, of the Princess Royal site, um, uh, which we inspected again as part of our first wave. And, and so, uh, actually, at the, just after it had been taken over by, by King's, um, I think that at that initial inspection will have given King's and ourselves a very good baseline uh, against which we will be able to assess whether they have made progress on quality. So I think uh, I'd prefer to, to wait until we've done the inspection there. I, yes, the, 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 the financial position is, is in the public domain, but, but we, will, we will see. Um, of course, with Heart of England, we hadn't done a pre-assessment uh, of, of quality there using our new approach. Um, but what people do say is that following the merger, things um, <coughs> got worse. But uh, that's not for us to judge at this stage. And of course, we're also looking at other uh, acquisitions and the Frimley Park, Wexham Park one. Uh, we're watching very closely to see if that one does work. Personal view is I, I would like to see these acquisitions um, restricted to those that, where the acquiring site is at least good, as assessed by CQC. Is there, <coughs> excuse me, is there, um, was it too early to say, is there any lessons we could draw to out of our inspections in regard to the way the governance of multi-site, multi-hospital um, groups? Um, or is that something that isn't our business? Well, it, it is under whether a trust is well led. Um, and, and so I, I, I don't think we should be dogmatic, but we can report on whether we think it's well led. Um, I think what I would say from that is you need a combination of good site or location management um, and cross site working. Um, uh, clinical groups working to the same clinical standards, and um, and and sometimes you see neither, um, and that's where things are, are, are really bad, where there isn't good site management and there isn't good cross-site working. So um, I think we will be able to learn more about that uh, in, in in due course, um, and and learn what really does work in, in for these multi-site trusts, or at least the two-site trusts. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll do the rest at speed, David, because uh, there are updates. Um, you uh, will receive at the next uh, April board meeting uh, an update on intelligent monitoring. I'll also give a briefing uh, later this morning to the board in relation to some um, further work we've done in relation to intelligent monitoring. So I'd, I'd prefer to discuss that later this morning if that's acceptable to colleagues. Um, there have been three reviews, not least of which is uh, Robert's in relation to freedom to speak up, and um, the Department of Health are now consulting on that uh, report. Uh, that consultation will take 12 weeks and began last week, I think. Um, and uh, in that, the specific question is asked is whether the national rule should be uh, part of uh, and based in the CQC. In addition, Eileen's been bringing forward some work, which again we considered at the executive team yesterday, about whether, uh, well, not whether, about how we should create our own capacity and capability uh, for a freedom to speak up guardian within CQC so that we can mirror uh, what um, others are being asked to do in the way that we operate. I previously reported on Kate Lampard's report just before it was published at the last meeting. It's now been published. And uh, what we've done in these paragraphs is um, um, say what uh, Mike and his colleagues in the Hospital Inspection Directorate are doing to take forward the recommendations uh, in Kate Lampard's report about how we'll uh, extend what we do on safeguarding in hospitals. It plays to the very first point we were making about safeguarding and Sally's comments. Um, we already check on the uptake of safeguarding training, but we will now add into a very specific conversation with the executive lead uh, questions around oversight of volunteers, celebrities and other groups, i.e. the issues that are identified by Kate Lampard. And, um, 
that will be part of the standard report we make on our services safe. Um, we also report on um, Dr Bill Kirkup's report on the Morecambe Bay investigation uh, that was also published at the beginning of March. Um, um, I think it's a report which is uh, definitive. Certainly, I think it's been welcomed by the families in the report. Uh, James Tickham, who's one of our employees, has been very prominent with the families in this, and I think James feels that um, his concerns and the issues which he's campaigned about over six years have been addressed in Dr Kirkup's report. And. Um, um, we, uh, in publishing a statement, reiterated the apology that we made um, uh, in 2013, David, when you and I went to visit some of the families. Um, the interesting thing from our point of view is um, Kirkup did comment on the changes, positively comment on the changes that have taken place in the way that we've um, changed the way that we regulate services, which... Um, um, I thought was generous and helpful. He'd no need to do that uh, in terms of the uh, report that he produced, but indeed he did do that, and um, we're grateful for, for that. There's no doubt in my mind that the experiences at Morecambe Bay have contributed to some of the changes that we've made in our methodology, and therefore there is a direct link between the complaints and concerns that families made and what we are now doing. Um, we've talked uh, about... Um, offering a meeting to those families that uh, we met in 13 uh, now that this is concluded so uh, if they're interested in that we'd propose that um, uh, David you and I and, and perhaps Mike might go meet them and see if there's any further comments that they want to make um, and rather than issue an apology through a press release we can do that directly to the face which I think is the, probably the human thing to do um, um, it may be they've moved on from wanting to do that, but that, that, that is being offered and we'll take that forward as well. So I think those three reports are all being taken and uh, informing the way that we're changing. Uh, the rest of the report, um, uh, I'm updating you on Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, these are um, very boring but very necessary statements of our relationships and we continue to set those out. Um, since the new year, uh, David, both you and I have been having conversations with uh, leaders across health and care where we've effectively said, tell us how you think we're doing, tell us what you think we're doing well, tell us what you think we're not doing as well, um, tell us what you think we should change. And paragraph 12 is a very brief precy of uh, a dozen or so of those conversations I've had with a variety of people. Um, I've had about another five or six since we drafted these paragraphs. Um, in that spirit and it's part of just making sure we're taking regular ongoing feedback and I thought it was worth just capturing uh, some of the comments in this report. Uh, I'm also uh, advising the board of changes that we've made to the scheme of delegation largely around the changes to market oversight which uh, is later in the agenda but also now we've got Kate Harrison in as our director of finance just some changes around delegations to ensure that um, she's got the delegations to do the job we're asking her to do. If I may, David, just raise one additional issue which has come to light. Uh, I think some colleagues around the table will know Peter Walsh, who's the Chief Executive of uh, Action Against Medical Accidents. Peter has been a, a campaigner over many, many years uh, around the duty of candor. And um, he has been raising both with us and the Department of Health a concern that he has about potentially two different definitions and two the, um, and potentially two different thresholds for the duty of candour as captured in the regulations. The um, two regulations are Regulation 20 and the subclauses of uh, Regulation 20. The, f the first clause relates to what's referred to as hospital bodies, trust hospitals basically. And the definition of duty of candor uh, and harm that is used is a definition used by the National Learning and Reporting System, which is severe and moderate harm. If you can go back when the bill was going through, Peter was campaigning to make sure that moderate harm was included in the definition. I think we supported that. Um, 
and that has now found its way into the regulations and is pretty clear and unambiguous and people know what that means, uh, severe and moderately defined. The second definition, though, um, uh, is slightly different for other bodies that are not health bodies. Um, implicit in the definitions are severe and moderate harm, but the language in the regulation is uh, fuller um, than uh, the very simple serious and moderate harm. This is a particular issue as it relates to general practice because uh, of this issue about the a different tradition of reporting serious uh, incidents in general practice, uh, including dentistry, but also independent health care. And there's a potential, Peter's frightened, there's a potential for confusion to arise as a consequence of these two different definitions. So one of the things that we need to do uh, is be uh, very clear about how CQC is interpreting those regulations and what that means for how we'll enforce that regulation. So GPs are encouraged to report incidents to the National Learning and Reporting System and to CQC. And if that practice uh, takes place, we should actually avoid what Peter's worried about is this confusion. So what we will do is we will update our guidance to make sure that providers are clear how these two definitions map against each other. So we'll do some further work over the next few days to clarify this. This is in from the 1st of April uh, to ensure that we're as uh, clear as we possibly can be in the words that we use to guide um, particularly colleagues in general practice, independent healthcare dentistry, about what it is that they need to notify and to whom they need to notify it. Uh, I think it's less of an issue around hospitals, um, but it's worth just pulling that out. As I say, um, Peter is a good campaigner, I have to say, and he doesn't miss a trick to campaign. So um, I think he's represented this in a fair way, and um, uh, it's important that we take notice of it. So I just wanted to pull that out, and this has all happened since these papers went out on Friday afternoon. Uh, but that's the report, David. Thank you. Thank you. Just on 12, I mean, it's, I think it's great to have these feedback discussions, and I know that the evaluation of, uh, of, of us is also going to include some of this. But I guess my question is, um, how, um, how we, what is the best process for getting feedback, um, legitimate feedback, for the development of our inspection process in particular, assessment process? Um, you know, we're halfway through the acute sector, for example, and um, so there's a question about that process outside of these conversations, particularly with us, I guess, as a board. And I think the second issue is, is um, um, for us to give thought to is how public that should be, because it would be nice, wouldn't it, to show that we are learning and this is a kind of public statement of how we are developing our system of assessment. Um, now, that could... There's a conversation next about the shaping the future conversation where such pointers could go in. But I think everyone understands we're at the beginning phase. We've done really well in our ins inspections particularly, uh, but we are developing. So how are we and what is our course correction from what we've heard and how public we, we should be in that is my question. Okay. I mean, um, Everybody wants to go. Oh, do they? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I got here first. You're um, <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, Jennifer, we do, we do a lot of informal meetings, normally through the old FTM NHS providers, when, when NHS Confederation with chief executives and people from Trust, who, whom we have inspected, to get feedback. Um, I think we discussed just a little bit earlier that maybe we would invite ten of the trusts that have been inspected um, to come and have a, a feedback, sort of an honest and frank feedback session with, with the board. And I think they would be honest, actually. I mean, I, think, I don't think they would try and butter us up. There's no need to. They've just been inspected. So I think we'll, we'll certainly organise that, and we can then feed that into uh, the future, if you like, the future paper. I'm not sure we can do that in public very easily, but we could, we could put the feedback, the results of the feedback, and discuss that in the next public, in the public board meeting. It would probably be the right way of doing it. You know, we're learning. Yeah. This is everyone's got to yeah. learn. 
and this is how we're, yeah. how we're, how we're listening, and this is the course correction. Mm. So we'll do that in June, <coughs> that's all right. And, 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 and Paul, Paul Corrigan is also in, in the adult social care um, would like a sort of a similar discussion with people providing, uh, you know, banks and private equity and um, the bigger providers on adult social care to see how they see the market shaping in the light of changes of the minimum wage, interest rates and, and the like. So we'll do that in June as well. But David, I, can I just add, add briefly? I mean, <clears throat> well, first of all, we have the Kieran Walsh study that was done um, back in sort of waves one and two. So we have that as a foundation. That we, we know that that was relatively positive, but showed that awful lot of things needed to be improved. Um, and I think we can at some point do a further formal evaluation. But it, it's also worth saying we do a lot of provider surveying at the moment um, and through uh, Paul's team, um, which actually we do report in the, the quarterly performance report. Um, and I'm pleased to say we actually get very positive feedback from that. So, I mean, not on every single issue, but but, um, but broadly speaking, those provider survey reports, to which we get a good response rate as well, um, are, are positive. 20 second. I guess that the issue that is on my mind the most is um, not so much the process and, and all that and how it feels like to be um, inspected. It's more that how people feel that we're really getting at quality with the things that we look at and put weight on. Can, can I just add to that? So I think this work that Paul Bert has been uh, taking forward on our behalf with Frontier Economics about our impact is the formal bit for this and I think as we develop that I think making that public and um, exposing the questions that we're asking of ourselves I think will then invite people into a space of a discussion but I think the beauty of that is that that methodology is being done outside of CQC so it's got a degree of independence and rigour about it um, but I think we should once we've got product from that I think we should set up seminars and workshops to discuss with people from outside in, in quite a a good academic way because I think there is a fundamentally important question here about whether this does have an impact and whether what we've set out to do is indeed being achieved because that is the ultimate question of uh, whether we're making an impact in that and whether we're successful. I don't think we should duck that question. And just to say, it's something that um, we explore on a regular basis with the external co-production group in adult social care, uh, because that's involving both experts by experience, um, uh, as well as uh, providers and commissioners, and getting feedback from them as to whether they think the, <coughs> A, the approach, um, in terms of the questions that we're asking, but be the subsequent reports uh, in, in terms of the information that's being provided, whether that does truly get underneath the skin of the service, give a good sense of quality and give people confidence about the, um, uh, the reports that are being produced. And again, you know, like Mike, there are always things that we can do to improve and we will continue to do that and sort of uh, there's no, no room for, complac for complacency. But there is a real feeling um, from the adult social care sector that I'm getting that we are getting at quality and we are getting underneath the skin of services and they're appreciating the, the increased rigour um, with which we're conducting the inspections now, which, you know, we're still in early stages, but I think that is encouraging. <coughs> I have something else about, about um, Morecambe Bay. The, um, I noticed yesterday in the medical press that uh, Bill Kirkup was um, criticising the colleges for being too defensive in their response to his report. Uh, and so I just want to make sure that uh, we are being um, as sort of forceful in our response as, uh, as the system needs to be. Um, I thought that it, was a, it was a really good, it was a seminal report, a really good report. And one of the good things about it was that it, as, long, as well as um, setting out what happened, it also tried to analyse the, <clears throat> the components of the system that went wrong to create a dysfunctional unit. Um, and that's quite an important message for us because that's a very it, vital that we make sure that our inspection methods, our induction of inspectors, all those things reflect those particular features. So he said that there was a loss of clinical competence. He said that relationships between professional groups was poor. He said that they operated, and this is the chilling bit, I think, the, that they operated to an ideology which became more important than safety. Uh, he said that they were poor at learning lessons from 
uh, and responding to investigations. Uh, and he said that they were poor at risk planning, at predicting who might be at risk and planning for them. And we just need to make sure that those five things, given that we have, in a way, a sort of definition, if not of quality, then at least of what risk might be based on, that that has to be properly built into what, what, what we do. Um, so that our inspectors are looking for that. I know we've got our five questions, but that, that needs to mesh with what has come out of, the, of one of the most important reports around. Um, so the current framework that we use when we're getting into the detail of safety um, has five key lines of inquiry. And without claiming that they are an exact map to what um, Kirk has recommended, there is a strong link across for the ability to uh, predict risk, the ability to do uh, effective real-time handovers are, are, are good examples and, and then moving to the well-led side of things, the way in which different clinical cultures interact. So I think we should feel confident that we've captured a lot of that because I think the work that Bill Kirkhouse finds is not inconsistent with Michael West's work, with Charles Vincent's work, which we've drawn heavily on, but as part of Jennifer's point about how we continually improve the quality of the way in which we inspect and regulate, we, should, we will bring in that work from Bill as well. And I, I suppose he said something very important, which is that um, the, these five elements added up to a, a dysfunctional unit in Morecambe Bay um, in maternity. But in fact, those individual elements are probably widespread, um, not all five, but in, individually, and not just in maternity units. And that's just something that we have to be... Um, Lewis, as you can imagine, I <coughs> read the report in much the same way as you did and then reflected on, so are we trying to capture those? I'm not saying we will all do it, always do it perfectly, um, but I think I, I can assure you that those five points are covered in different parts of our inspection with under our headings. I mean, for example, we have a, a, a subheading that we always report on, um, under, actually under effective, which is about multidisciplinary team working. Um, and that is, w the questions we ask there are, uh, for example, in maternity, we would ask specifically about the relationships between midwives and obstetricians. That, um, but, and as, as you say, it's not only in maternity. We can see this sometimes in operating theatres, for example, that there may be poor relationships there as well. So I, I think... Uh, having been through the report, I think we are covering it. The question is, are we covering it well enough, obviously, um, and um, w we will constantly reflect on that. Um, <clears throat> what struck me yet again, sadly, from this report is um, all the things, of course, that have been said, but they all have been discovered because of an analysis of some individual tragedies, which <clears throat> tragedies which were not looked into or recognised at the time they occurred. And one of the things I continue to, to worry about, and I hope worries us all, is how we actually relate the... How we, how we react to individual incidents from which sometimes, quite often, actually, uh, if looked into properly, uh, systemic issues of some gravity uh, can be detected. And I still worry that... Um, the systems we have at CQC, combined with every other form of reactive system, often fails to capture that very significant fact from the individual complaints that get made. And I just wonder what, what reflection we can have on that. Sorry. Not you. I, I, think, um, I think we've had discussions various times about, I think, what's crucial is the breadth of what counts as knowledge that we take on board. Um, and I think what's happened uh, before is that we only counted as knowledge the stuff that we did, rather than actually listening to a whole range of other knowledges. Um, and I think all of these uh, reports, yours and Kirkup's report, are a sort of humbling criticism of those people that only depend upon whether it's CQC or whatever, the knowledge that they count as knowledge, um, rather than listening to either individual tragedies or individual moans or all sorts of other knowledge that's out there. Um, and I think the way in which what I hear about our inspections now is there is a much wider breadth of, uh, of a sort of restlessness of searching for other voices um, uh, uh, and to ensure that uh, as uh, the inspections sort of spread out, 
and try and get those different voices. I don't think I don't think I think the restlessness is what's crucial because I don't think you'd ever know you're getting to them all. <coughs> Um, two or three, um, hopefully, quick points. I, I agree with um, Robert and Lewis about the Kirkup report. Well, everybody who's commented on the Kirkup report, which incidentally was very well written. I mean, it was um, quite a, it was a compelling read, actually. Um, and I don't know who helped him write it, but um, I think whoever it was, it would be interesting to see if we could get them on board here. Because, <laughs> Uh, you know, th that's not a criticism, but it, it just struck me how, um, you know, that was a long report, or relatively long, but um, it gripped you, you know, throughout. I think the point Robert makes is, is very important, and I just don't know uh, how intelligent monitoring deals with that, because in, in some sense the heart of this was these series of incidents which were regarded by the CQC and um, by others as unconnected, when in fact the, you know, the toxic relationship between the midwives and clinicians and indeed this, um, you know, the midwives ideology um, was really at the heart of um, these apparently unconnected incidents, but of course connected by this um, in a toxic culture at, uh, at the hospital. The second point, um, some colleagues were at the dinner last night, which was very interesting, because it, um, our guests really were asking more of us rather than less of us, which um, was important. And I think the more of us, the, the more they were asking for, is that we should be more directional or more directive about what improvements um, should be made and how they should be made. And this may be just a question of whenever we find problems of saying, and I think Mike touched on this uh, last night, of saying, well, you know, this is where we find bad practice to actually say in our reports, this is, where our, this is how outstanding hospitals in this particular you know, when they deal with this particular problem or in this particular uh, part of the hospital, this is what they do, and this is what we expect you to do over the next, you know, six months, whatever time period we give them. And as I say, it was just intriguing that um, instead of there being sort of you're trying to do too much or, um, you know, apart from a little bit of um, complaints about the number of inspectors, which I think Mike dealt with extremely well, in general, you know, the mood was the CQC should be doing more. And although perhaps we shouldn't be, you know, doing improvement ourselves, we should be much clearer about the improvement we want to see and um, where this hospital or um, care home or GP should be getting to through using uh, best practice much more frequently in our reports. Can I just, going back to your first point, Michael, about the apparently unrelated incidents, I think, to me, that was one of the key learnings from Bill Kirkup's report. Um, and I can assure you we are already taking heed of that um, in another situation um, where there were apparent unrelated incidents, and that has caused us to go back into a hospital. I think, I think Michael has articulated very well what I took out of the, we discussed it earlier this morning, actually, what I took out of the dinner last night, that the, the, the bit of our, our purpose, which is to encourage improvement, I don't think we have put enough flesh around that. I mean, it's not enough just to do a rating. I mean, a rating on its own, I think particularly in the hospital context, is not enough in terms of impro encouraging improvement. It is sharing best practice. It is, I think someone used the expression of dating agency as well. I think maybe we need to put some more flesh on that, um, and, and maybe that takes us into the next item, doesn't it? The future. Yeah. So d just just to add to that and draw some of it together. So yesterday at the executive team, Malta Gerhold, who's our director of strategy, brought a high-level paper on 
asking exactly this question. Uh, we didn't know what the dinner was going to unravel, but um, unravel being the operative word. Um, um, but it did ask the question of what do we mean? What, what does this mean for what we do? And how would we discharge uh, uh, what is effect? I think it's clause three of the 2008 Act, which says our purpose is to encourage improvement. So it, it's not just we put it in our statement of purpose. It's a responsibility the legislation gives us to take forward. And I think, um, I think our conclusion was that that you've just made, David, which is um, this is underpowered and insufficiently clear about what it means for what we need to do. So we'll take that forward. Um, I, I've spoken directly to Bill Kirkup since he published his uh, report and um, said that um, I, I think it's very well written, very clearly articulated, and is a very good uh, report. Um, I wonder whether board colleagues might be interested in either inviting him to a dinner or inviting him to a board meeting to, in a sense, have the conversation with him. I think some of the points that you've pulled out, Lewis, were um, very important. Uh, I'd also asked him whether he might be prepared to do a, a workshop for staff, uh, frontline staff. Uh, if we could, you could do that on a webinar, we could reach into all two and a half thousand of our staff. Uh, I didn't ask him about the dinner, uh, but he did say yes to uh, seminar for staff. So if I take away one of the actions from this meeting, David, to try and get uh, see if he'd be interested in joining either a board meeting or a dinner for a more um, a, a conversation with him about his report, and um, we'll, we'll press ahead anyway with a, a, a workshop for staff, um, albeit it's like to be a webinar that will be then embedded in the... Um, uh, electronic uh, development system that we've got, but um, uh, we can take that bit forward, and we can bring uh, Malta's work from the ET to a future meeting of um, the board. M my recommendation will be to take that in a, a workshop setting first before we start uh, socialising papers. But um, let, let's have the conversation on the next report and then pick that up. But that's an option for a workshop as well. Just last, just on the point that actually that Paul and Robert made um, about list, being restless and listening to to more people. Of course, a lot of the lot of those voices are difficult to listen to. Um, they're often um, not the most articulate or literate voices. They are difficult to listen to, and it. But we just we must do it. I mean, I find it difficult. You know, when the same person writes to you for the umpteenth time and. It is difficult to do. You start to get exasperated, but actually they can be very revealing. So, anyway, um, next item, Paul. So I think the um... okay, the, uh, the next two items are, are heavily linked. The Shaping the Future publication and the business plan, uh, not least because we would propose to put the Shaping the uh, Future publication um, as part of an early part of the business plan, as well as being a standalone document. Um, both these documents are, are the results of work for, uh, for people right across CQC. They're very important documents to us. Um, and people like Libby and Sarah and Chris Day named on the front of this paper, but also lots of other people uh, right across the directorates. Um, I will do a bit of moving between the two papers, but I'll, I'll, I'll focus on this one. But just to say that the um, in the business plan, the two external facing priorities, one is essentially to finish what we started by embedding the new approach to regulation, and the second is to shape the future. That's the, the, the heart of the link to this paper. Um, there are three components of the way in which we want to shape the future. Uh, the first is uh, the way in which we regulate um, for new models of care. We want to be absolutely clear with everybody uh, that we won't stand in the way um, of good and innovative uh, practices. Um, as Andrea mentioned earlier, we're improving our registration processes so they are more robust, they are more based on the five key questions, but we don't want people to take the message from that. There is somehow a hurdle that any new model of care cannot get over. Uh, quite the opposite, we want to encourage improvement in all the sectors. Uh, so that's the first point. The second point is around pathways of care, journeys of care through the system. Um, and along with the third point, which is about looking at localities, uh, these are both about reaching beyond our individual provider or location-based regulation. Hopefully it's clear from the, um, the business plan and the first priority around finishing what we started that we are not in any way uh, signaling that we're not doing location-based regulation. We will continue to do that. What we're saying is that that in itself won't be enough for us. Uh, it's important that uh, people live lives that cut right across 
uh, different sectors of care, let alone providers within that sector, we need to be um, cognizant of that and, and effectively regulating and assessing against that. So we have a programme of thematic work that the board is familiar with uh, that will continue. We will report on mental health crisis, care, end of life care uh, as examples in 15-16, uh, and we will orient our, our whole thematic programme to those, those journeys of care through the, uh, the adult social care and health care systems. And when it comes to the localities, we have an increasing uh, evidence base uh, as we uh, move forward with our ratings across the different sectors. At a minimum, that allows us to look at localities from the perspective of what are the, uh, the rated providers and locations in those localities. We think we can do that, but we could also go further. We propose to take two particular areas of the country, be that rural areas or cities or towns, um, and look in detail at the, um, the quality of care for the population, segments within the population uh, for, uh, for those areas. Um, and that is all, of course, underpinned by uh, the engagement plan so that the, the public providers, our stakeholders, are aware of the ongoing work that we're doing. That's uh, at the heart of what this document is trying to convey. Um, I, I was um, encouraged to, to to read this. The question I have is, um, is how whether we need to say something about how we match our, our powers and the, the legal responsibilities that other people have with our regulation and oversight of pathways, new models of care, and so on, which won't fit within those entirely within those entities. So, for example, um, we ask the five questions about a pathway of care, and we find that in one instance, at one place somewhere in, the, in there, it's gone wrong and there's not, it's not safe or it's not effective or it's not responsive. And we need to consider, do we not, without getting in the way of the development, how we actually respond to that deficiency, because it may be that the registered provider says, well, it's not down to me, it's something upstream from here. Uh, and yet when you go upstream, that doesn't seem to, to sort of fit in what, what we're looking at. I don't know if I'm making myself very clear. But it, 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 we do need to think, do we not, as to whether we actually have the right powers to deal with the new situation. We need to ensure that those who are busy making new models of care and pathways and all the rest of it um, uh, take that in, into account as well. That's not a question of stopping things happening. It's just making sure that all the parties, including government, enable these things uh, to carry on um, safely. Um, so part of the work that we're doing with the Department of Health at the moment as they prepare for briefing um, whatever the set of incoming ministers is, um, is reviewing what we think our um, totality of future powers should be so that um, we can be clear with, um, with the department and with, the, with any new ministers about that. Uh, now, having said that, though, we do have a lot of powers that go beyond just the, the role of the individual location or provider, particularly our Section 48 powers, and that allow us to investigate or review um, the, the quality of care, of care in, in a sort of across multiple providers. We also have um, potential powers which we could exercise um, around commissioning. Uh, that requires sign-off from Secretary of State. Uh, but they, they exist in law, and there was some um, uh, effort to make those more independent um, that this government announced. So as we develop the work on how we want to look at localities, we can work through what powers we can already exercise beyond our sort of provider regulation powers. Um, and as one of the reasons that we're signalling the work we're doing in 15 and 16 is so that we're well placed to develop the five-year strategy, which we intend to go from April 16 through to 2021, uh, that would, it would be more in sync with, if we needed new legislation, primary or secondary, we could um, canvas for that. <coughs> and I think what's, <coughs> what's important about this um, exactly this discussion we've just had, is that this is what's going on in the NHS and social care in the construction of the new models themselves. Some of the ways in which it's being, they're being made are at the edges of legality uh, and are then going up to the uh, DH and saying, look, if you really want to do this, we need these, we need these changes to be made. Um, uh, and the vanguard process that's been set up is part of it is as people try and do new things, when they come across real barriers, then that actually needs to be dealt with up there. Um, uh, and so we're part of that. This is why the, this is such an important document.
document. We're part of that change where we're going to find ourselves on the edge of what we can do and saying that we can either do this properly, but then that needs to be... So there will be, hopefully, uh, uh, over the next year, not just something about CQC powers, but powers of all of the organisations across health and social care to construct a pathway that, at the moment, they can't do. Can I just say that what, what worries me is that uh, the history of the NHS is listed with examples of people and organisations being able to somewhat sit back and say, oh, it wasn't my responsibility, it was someone else's. And um, the, the, this, this sort of process we're going through seems to be likely to raise many, far too many opportunities for that to occur again, and that's what concerns me. Not that it should be stopped, but that needs to be at the forefront of how people construct what they do. Thanks. I think this is, this is very good. Um, the, the addition I would make is... Um, there's something uh, about um, how we are developing, as per the previous conversation, our current systems of assessment during the year, and just signalling that. I know we're going to new areas, these new models and so on, but how we're doing that. And also, whether it's too much put in a document like this, where we see it going, you know, what's our aim um, over the longer term? Do we, uh, are we developing our model in order to pull back from inspection eventually, because as we get more developed, um, is it becoming more risk-based in terms of frequency? Um, do we want to say a little bit more about um, <coughs> how much we can and think we can depend on intelligent monitoring, um, things like that, how much we will depend on fees, or is that really too far ahead in this document, which is really focused on 1516? So it's a kind of normal business and how, that, how we see that as well as the new models. I, I think that is the answer <laughs> at the end of the question, that we separately will have the five-year strategy, which is absolutely our opportunity to set out. We will consult on that during 1516. Um, so all those questions of how we are looking to advance the provider regulatory model, the uh, how we will uh, extend intelligent monitoring through into comprehensive surveillance was laid out a bit in the knowledge and information strategy. I think we should hold it for that document and the consultation of it in order that we can be as clear and precise about the, the new side of things that's laid out in the Shape in the Future document. That's my personal view. Um, so it's a small point then, thanks, whether or not we even signal that, that's what we will be looking at. And just, on, just before you leave that, Jennifer, yeah. I think, I, I think that I'm quite persuaded we ought to signal it, Paul, that we are, we're not keeping, a, you know, we are, our existing model is evolving and changing going uh, forward. That, that would be, yeah. that's really helpful yeah. and we, we will absolutely okay. do that. It's a different thing between laying out any detail, but we can definitely signal it. Okay, sorry, one last quick thing. On encouraging services to improve, um, there's all this, as we speak, I think NHS England will probably be discussing the improvement architecture and how that might change. Now that it's all very fluid, so we can't signal that much, but I just, I think it echoes previous comment whether or not we could say anything in here about where we exist in the firm, this changing firmament, what we, what we are doing, which is listed here, but what we're not doing, because others... So that's a rather vague comment, but it, 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 at the moment, there's, it's, it's rather empty, this... Um, we say what we're doing, but meantime, there's a lot of other um, changes going on. Yeah, so, so a little... Where are we in that map? And, and acknowledging that that's uh, changing, I think, is the other... I also thought that um, Shaping the Future was a very good paper. I've only got really two thoughts. One is that I think we should more explicitly um, link the work that we're going to do in 15, 16, whether they're thematic reviews or whatever, with particular vanguards. I mean, there are 29 of them. And I think just... Um, it would be, for example, some of the vanguards clearly are about improving the health and health outcomes for frail and elderly people, or at least they say that's what their objective is. I think for our thematic review into um, care for older people, we should do that in the vanguards which are trying to improve that. At the very least, as I think I mentioned last night, we might be able to provide that vanguard with something approaching, um, you know, a sort of a pre and post um, uh, 
understanding of whether it's improved or not. One of my, my own concerns about the Vanguard is that, that nobody appears to be setting up any controls. So how will you know whether you know Vanguard X is actually doing better as a result of being a Vanguard than an area which isn't a Vanguard? Um, and there doesn't seem to be any, uh, well, uh, unless this is happening at NHS England or, you know, unless we're involved in this, there doesn't seem to be any, you know, pre and, um, pre and post capability. But I think, you know, that, you know, we could play that role because uh, in 1516, we could take a number of vanguards. We obviously can't take all 29 and understand, you know, how effective um, they are at the moment so that we can, you know, later measure the impact of the vanguard. I think there's one other point, I think, directly for Paul, which is in order to measure, um, you know, their success or, you know, population-based systems or accountable care organisations, what data would we actually want to have? Because clearly, a lot of our data at the moment is very institution-specific. Um, so I think a part of shaping the future should be to determine, and I think it is important for us, you know, regardless of whether it's in this document or not, to understand um, what we would need to know and how we would get that data. Does that data exist? Um, would it have to be built? Uh, I don't know. So sorry, there is. Um, it's very important. This, these questions. It is a bigger question, which is beyond our role, which is about the evaluation of these uh, Vanguard sites. Um, that there is going to be an, a separate evaluation, and part of that evaluation may well um, use match control sites. So there's another industry, if you like, which is evaluation that may be beyond us, um, and we may be part of it. But it's we're not the complete picture here because there are other things that need to be done in an evaluation that we don't do. Um, I, I, I think that's very helpful to, to hear from Jennifer. I, I, I think just pushing this a little bit further, we should be putting the onus on, without making it too heavy an onus, on um, the, the, the Vanguard projects to look at what they want, you know, to, to build in this assessment for themselves of what they are going to uh, use to assess whether or not they've actually achieved what they're setting out to achieve. Um, and, and, and make that one of the things which, which we're looking to them to provide, rather than us trying to dictate to them what it should be. Because I think that's, that's a piece of work which we could spend an awful lot of time doing. And it's, it's really, as I say, not, not, I think, our responsibility on that. It should be down to others. Um, so the, in, in um, the, I, I, I mean, I like the paper, and I'm really glad we're, we're doing it. So, so, um, uh, so, so far, so good. And I, I think in in, but I think in point one, regulating new care models, there's a lot of. Um, uh, nothing wrong with this. It's a place we should be. Of what we will do, we will share. We will be clear. We will reinforce. Um, and then in uh, uh, on the last page in our engagement plan, um, we will engage. But it feels like a very kind of passive engagement, um, and uh, uh, that may not be the intention. But I think it'd be really good if we could signal something different. So, um, so I think it's fair to say, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that we have had. I mean, your report speaks to this, David. Um, particularly good report of the very explicit co-production model that Andrea has used in social care, and and I and, and I think it's not to say that other people have that the other in the other areas we haven't done the same thing, but actually in hospitals we had to work at speed, which probably didn't allow for some of that to happen. So it's been different in different di 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 different uh, sectors, but I think there's a bit of a learning for us about the value of working in that way, and. Um, and I would really like that um, uh, we are more explicit about working in that way in this in, in this uh, uh, new arena. And and there's a very um, for me very important reason uh, for that um, because it kind of comes out that we will work in that way with the providers of service and arguably therefore also the commissioners. Um, but what's less explicit is that we will work with uh, users of service. Uh, in, in, in that way, and 
And I suppose it, it, there's a nagging concern in my head about the whole of the Five Year View programme is that it is not um, sufficiently grounded in a, a commitment to really truly engage with local uh, po communities and users of service. And, and part of the reason for that is that it is, again, working at speed. And one of the things that we know takes time is working with uh, people and especially working with people for whom actually the, um, the change proposition is quite difficult because people's, uh, you know, members of the public, users of service, often first response to change is, well, no, I want more of what I've got because I don't want that to go away. You know, um, at least that's uh, meeting my needs. And you need to get, help people to get to, work quite hard to get people to get to a, a place where they feel comfortable with the idea that actually there could be something better um, and then to help you design what better might look like. So um, clearly, we're not um, in the process here of designing those better services, but we are in the process here of designing um, what could be a significant, um, significantly different model for regulating those services. And I think uh, we would do well to um, make that kind of commitment and then follow through with proper co-production with the public as well as with service providers. Um, well, the first thing to say is that um, nearly all the points that I've um, jotted down have been covered by my colleagues, so um, I think that uh, shows that we're kind of uh, uh, mostly on the same page, which is um, a good thing. Um, the point that um, hasn't been made um, is around um, sort of a potential opportunity with these new models, um, it, you know, in terms of looking at things uh, around sort of systems and population groups. Um, I mean, it may be something that we are considering, but, um, you know, one of the things that sometimes gets raised um, is, is that we um, only regulate or get the experiences of people who are actually using the services. We don't look at people who are not receiving a service. We don't look at um, unmet need. We don't uh, and it also links into sort of health inequalities as well. Um, so m my kind of point, really, and, and, and question is, this isn't obviously just for us, um, but if we are looking at, we are going to look at sort of systems and population groups, it is a real opportunity to um, report on, um, you know, what's going well and what isn't going well, um, particularly with regards to, to, to um, inequalities and un, unmet need, uh, and indeed to sort of encourage improvement in this. So uh, it will be good to sort of at least have an idea if this is, these are the sorts of issues that we can build in, um, working with others if, if and when, when we need to. I just, just one, one th uh, further thought on exactly that, because I, I, I think in our co-production model, our, uh, we, ha we have depended quite heavily on experts by experience. That's, <laughs> that's a good thing, and it, it's important that we do that. But I think Kay's point is exactly right. When you're moving into new, new, new models in particular, that, that, that gives you only part of the picture. So we need to think about ways in which we can engage with people who are not in that category um, and who, 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 who might come from quite different places. Quick comment. Um, the, um, it's right that we focus on five-year forward view models, but actually there's quite a lot of innovation out, out with those models, not least including social enterprises. So I think if, as long as we just add a little proviso and others who are innovating and think about all the prime contractor models there are around that are doing interesting things and are further down the track. Do you want, yes? No. Yeah, to, if I try to respond, but sort of overall rather than pick every single point out, is that helpful? Do it that way? Okay. Um, so, uh, and the first thing to say is that we, we have deliberately tried to keep this relatively narrow and focused, and that is with one eye on the business plan and the other things that we have to do on the priority to finish what we started, um, and the resources we're working <coughs> with and the recruitment we have available. Um, so that has to guide the prioritisation. Within that, I think that's the next point is the work is re heavily related and linked to the new models of care from the five-year forward view, but isn't synonymous with it. I think it's a really good point that uh, if there are other models of care um, that are developing, but they happen not to be one of the seven named, then we should be absolutely looking at those as well. 
um, which I think gets to the heart of what what are these vanguards actually. So I sit on the, uh, the, the new models of care program board that Sam Jones um, uh, chairs and chairs very well, precisely because the five year full view is not an NHS England document alone. It's the, the so called sextet um, of, uh, of arms length bodies, which includes CQC, and that's our commitment to being part of that, um, as well as uh, remaining uh, uh, independence in our regulatory functions. So the whole point of the vanguards, and it's why it's important that they really are evaluated, and I made this one uh, uh, to the team there, um, is to say there are particular models of care which look sensible, working at pace, um, uh, from what the literature says and where the energy around the country is, but they're almost certainly not the only things that can be done. So there were lots of excellent applications for vanguards, but they didn't actually uh, correspond to any of the seven models, and so they were knocked out on that basis <coughs> because the idea is to evaluate those particular models of care and understand what it will take nationally to remove the barriers for those particular models. Okay, so we're putting some bets. People saying it's not about having a single plan for the NHS, but uh, but it's not about a thousand flowers blooming. It's about trying to suggest there uh, there are uh, uh, discrete numbers of ways that we would expect all the local <laughs> health systems to be adopting in one form or another. So the emphasis on the vanguards and the way we need to sort of play into that is understanding that they shouldn't be comprehensive, but that we really should be trying to learn from them as well as supporting them. Um, as far as engagement and co-production goes, um, it's, a it, it's a really, I think, insightful when we, when we write this, we, we, I think we, we, we genuinely, we just, it's implicit to us now that we're moving to much more towards that co-production, which is not to claim we always do it, but when my team writes this, they're not writing it from the voice of some sort of passive engagement. So I'll ask them to just remember that that may not come across um, and to bring that out and to particularly include that the, the need to that co-production with the public as well as uh, with providers, and that shouldn't just be through experts by experience, uh, and nor was that the, nor was that the intention. Um, and then just finally, on the, um, the inequalities point, um, it's something we're, we're trying to bring out on our thematics already, but I think we, we'll do more. So the end of life care thematic is particularly looking at end of life care inequalities, um, and that's not just ine inequalities across the like, protected characteristics, but also inequalities across simply just different disease groups. We know that cancer end of life care it tends to be better uh, than than for others. So that's something we've really tried to do um, and report on. But we'll make sure that wherever we can exploit that through this shape in the future work, we will. So. So it's really a question for both Jennifer and Paul. I, I hadn't realised that um, there was going to be this, this kind of evaluation group, so it would be very interesting to hear more about it, because I would have thought, in, you know, in principle, because the CQC is an independent regulator, we would actually be best placed to do evaluation um, because of our independence, plus you know, we already, I think cover is perhaps not quite the right word, but, you know, we inspect hospitals, care homes, you know, primary care, um, you know, the combination of our independence and our cross-sectoral expertise, I would have thought would make us a natural body to do this evaluation. But so it would be interesting to know who's going to do the evaluation and how we're going to relate to that evaluation. So there's um, regulatory activity and then there's research and evaluation of complex service-based interventions. The two things are actually very, very different. And uh, we're not set up to do that kind of complex. Uh, we, don't do, we don't have the methodologies. We don't often have the data, actually. We have some data, but we don't have all that's necessary. We don't have a qualitative arm of research. Uh, we don't have the methods on the quantitative side because that's not what we're meant to do. Um, there are many third parties who can do, well, not many, there are some third parties who can do that uh, in the research university community. And clear, clearly we, have a, we can add to that, but um, it's, evaluation is just a different topic and with different methodological um, uh, ways into that that we don't have and we're not set up for that. It doesn't mean to say we can't contribute in some way. I think, I think that's right, but it doesn't mean that we can't shape, uh, as we see in the evaluation, and how, how it should be conducted. 
so we can have confidence that it's looking at the right things. And I, I didn't answer your question on um, catapult care organisations and the data. So we've, I think we've talked in the past about whether we are sufficiently flexible already as a regulator to deal with new models of care. We're very confident that we can because we've adopted a modular approach. We already bring that together. Isle of Wight is a very good example of that, bringing different uh, blocks of our regulatory framework together where, where a provider covers many, many services. But accountable care organisations or variants on them do represent a new challenge because inherently they are taking a population risk. So it, I think the data, the data there will, it will find it's actually much more akin to the commissioning data sets because fundamentally it's about the population outcomes, which is what the local commissioning frameworks as well as the national outcomes framework have been trying to get at. So as and when we actually see an accountable care organisation develop uh, or some other prime contractor, uh, it seems to me we need to start from the perspective of what's already been collected about health outcomes and care outcomes from the commissioning perspective, because that's really what they're trying to deliver. One thing that people feel very strongly about in mental health at the moment is something we've talked about before, and that's the role of the commissioners. And so it would, because they, um, the, there is a recognition that in how we feed back to organisations, we, we pick up the, the broader health economy. So we're not just saying this is a problem, there's a problem here and it's the provider. There's a recognition that the improvement relies on commissioners as well. Um, but, they, the, but the providers, I think, still feel that they are in the frame and other people aren't. And that's particularly happened in mental health because of the reports that, as you'll have seen, that um, funding has dropped in mental health. Uh, so they're getting 8% less money in real terms now than they were getting five years ago. And they are saying, well, um, how is that being taken into account when, you're, when we're being rated? Um, and it's one thing to say, well, the commissioners are there when we have uh, the summits and the feedback meetings and the development plans. Um, but it's the trusts themselves that have to pin our ratings on their notice boards. Um, and the commissioners are not really in the frame for that. Now, the, this is, um, I know this is a complex argument about our powers and so on, there's a lot we've talked about it before, but I think we have to have, we have to be able to spell out, in, in the interest of fairness, what will be different in, say, a year's time or two or three years' time, um, uh, given that our powers are not going to change dramatically, but what will be different which will make them feel that they're being more fairly uh, dealt with? Um, there's lots of that might, might, I think, want to come in as well. I know on, on the specific of how we deal with commissioners, as it were, um, and this is what I might want to come in, when we have a quality summit, the commissioners are in the room, and I think particularly where there are challenges of the provider, Mike and his colleagues are, are very, very clear, uh, without wanting to speak for you, Mike, uh, where, where the commissioners need to step up. Um, we've in the past taken the view that we've been in our rights to write letters to commissioners if we need to, uh, to highlight poorly commissioned models of care, uh, for example. Um, one of the things we need to look at for the five-year strategy work is where we are heading in terms of understanding provider finance in pursuit of doing our job well. Um, I, th I think the, the, the data on mental health and the real-terms funding falls really important that that's exposed. What we don't know is whether there was enough money to do the job five years ago. We don't have that baseline. We don't know what the... Um, uh, the details, we'd have to look into that as, as to what the demographic pressures are relative to any other sector, uh, what the ability is to change um, uh, the uh, thresholds of care, where that's happening. For example, in adult social care, we know absolutely one of the responses of commissioners has been to change thresholds so that fewer people receive local authority funded care. So it's a very complicated space when you're trying to judge what I think you're leading into, this, which is the value of the service provided, not just its quality. It's something we will look at in the strategy, though. Mike, just la a last yeah, word. Very, very briefly, on. just to echo the point about quality summits. We recently had a quality summit where a provider said to us uh, they had achieved more in 40 minutes with a call in, in terms of moving their commissioners on than they had in the previous four years. So I think we, we can sometimes have that impact. All right, thanks very much. Well, Paul, you've got quite a few points to reflect, I think, in, the, in this document. Yes, absolutely, and, and we will... General, uh, it, people like the document, though. It's just, it's just adding to it. If, if I understood the board steer was that yeah. it, was, uh, it was going well as a document, there were some things we needed to yeah. signal, but the basic three-part structure yeah. is the right one. I wouldn't want to misunderstand yeah, that. Right. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Should we to the next item, which is you, you again, Paul. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Um, so th uh, the the business plan for 1516. Um, we were we, we published a two-year business plan um, uh, covering uh, the year we're just ending and this current year um, as part of our sort of transformation. So this is, if you like, the second year of a, of a two-year business plan. Um, as I said a moment ago, four overall priorities, two of them external, uh, embedding our, our new approach to regulation and shaping the future, and that's supported by two internal priorities, building an effective CQC and uh, demonstrating the difference we make. Some of that touches on the, sort of the evaluation conversation we were just having, but applied to us. Um, there's a lot of work underway already, a lot more work that's been laid out in the business plan. I don't propose to go through that. The structure of the business plan, reflecting previous conversations uh, with the board, uh, tries to flow much more clearly now through from the purpose of CQC, the two-part purpose of uh, ensuring people get safe, fair to compassionate, high quality care and encouraging services to improve, and then through into what would we therefore define success to be, from, the, from our costing model all the way through up to our inputs and processes, the uh, intermediate outcomes and the sort of full outcomes in terms of impact and better quality care. That then allows us to set the KPIs, and that's what drives the particular priorities and the actions under them. That's uh, hopefully how the document comes across. That, that has been implicit in our thinking. Uh, and Michael was, was raising that point. That was, that was helpful to, to make sure we were testing our thinking there. Um, a couple of points to draw out on the business plan. Um, as part of um, uh, the we set out what our inspection targets are. For, that's for when we will complete individual ratings programmes. That's in one of the annexes. Um, and we draw attention to the fact that in, uh, in a number of cases that means completing ratings programmes uh, after um, at, a, at a slightly later date than we had uh, originally set out to do. That's because of a number of factors. We've been open about our, um, the challenges of recruiting. We expected it to be difficult. It has been difficult. Uh, but we have a lot of uh, inspectors coming in. Um, one of the things we've really learned over the year, I think Chief Inspectors um, would hopefully echo this, is just uh, as people get more confidence in our model of regulation, so they're willing to raise more issues with us. Uh, so a lot of our inspectors' time is taken up on site visits, quite rightly, but so is a lot of it is dealing with the concerns that come in. And we absolutely can't just, just be in the business of rating and not looking at those concerns. That would be totally inappropriate. So we need to balance that correctly, and that's another factor uh, in, um, in why we set the end of the ratings programme sector by sector. Um, and the third part is, as we have discovered through the concerns, through the uh, inspections, uh, in some sectors more concern, uh, more poor care than we might have expected at the outset. So it's important we go back and, uh, and check that that care is improving. Um, and that's, a, if you like, an inspection that's carried out with somebody who's already been rated. That's not a resource that's being um, focused on uh, rating somebody else. So that has an impact. All those things have an impact. We set out what we think is a credible plan uh, and have discussed and agreed that with the Department of Health. Um, the other part, um, which again Eileen may want to comment on too, is the financial settlement, uh, which is laid out in the paper, uh, but amounts to um, 120 million of, uh, of grant in aid uh, alongside our fees and, um, and a risk sharing agreement, taking the total amount of our expected income to 249 million on a revenue basis. And although we haven't signed off the capital with the department as yet, I don't think any of the arms and bodies that I'm aware of have. Uh, we've put in a bed for 17 million on the capital. Uh, we are confident that uh, we need that money to do the job that we've set out. Um, and grateful to DH, particularly on the revenue side, that they've uh, they've agreed to that. It's probably a good place for me to stop because there's a lot in this document, but that hopefully is is the overview. Thanks, Paul. Any Jennifer? Right. Thank you. I think it's very good and very pithy, and succinct. Um, the only thing I would say, it's just a, it's a relatively small point, but is on in your letter. David, at the beginning, your introduction, rather, David's, um, to almost um, acknowledge the encouraging services to improve role um, that didn't come through in the introduction. And the, the, the reason why I'm pointing this out is because of the kind of widespread perception that the 
clobber to support balance in the system is really overbearing on the clobbering. I mean, that's the kind of street, street view. Uh, and given the fact the next couple of years are going to be the toughest probably on record in the NHS, the fact that we're thinking about how we, with others, support improvement, even if we're not doing it, um, just to kind of put that more to the forefront, I think would be very welcome. I think getting this balance between enforcing minimum standards and also trying to encourage improvement is a very difficult balance to get. And I think that um, if we set ourselves up in an adversarial relationship with providers and clinicians, then we are in the wrong place. On the other hand, we've got to call, out, call it out when we see bad practice. And I think it is, it is a difficult balance to get, but maybe we should reflect that, that we're aware of that issue and in more. It's neither one nor the other. It's both, actually. Yeah. And to develop the, the, the other side of what that paragraph there. I mean, there isn't, an, as we've discussed with NHS England Board when they came to see us, there is no improvement strategy per se for the NHS. And therefore, where we sit in our efforts compared to everybody else is also indistinct, which isn't helping at the moment. But I think there are some, some plans to change that. But it's just a sig signal in this document that we're... I think it's important to do that, yeah. Uh, Anna? So, sorry, I, I, I missed the very beginning of your introduction, but I don't know whether you talked about the risk ap appetite or not risk, but, but can I talk about that? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I, a uh, couple, couple of things, really. Um, uh, one, uh, and the main, I suppose the main one is that if you read this document, what you get is a, um, a low to medium, medium in relation to operational risk um, tolerance throughout. Um, but actually, I think that belies the difficulty of um, implementing something like this, because actu actually, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, there is a real tension between um, low risk, as it's described, um, in relation to public confidence risk, and low risk um, as it's described in relation to regulatory and legal risk. I'm sure there are other, other, other areas, but I'm going to pick up that, that one. The reason is because in order to um, adopt a low risk tolerance in relation to public confidence as defined, actually what we're talking about is uh, um, uh, taking action, which is quite risky, um, uh, on the basis of lim potentially limited um, uh, intelligence in order to protect the public uh, uh, from uh, uh, from harm, so so if we think about sort of safeguarding or uh, 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 other material that comes in through the system, we're saying that because of the public confidence issue, um, uh, I think we say we would we, we would then uh, um, take some action um, on the basis of uh, quite limited information because we would want to be sure that there wasn't a, 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 a harm. That of course could open us up to. Uh, uh, quite significant regulatory and legal risk um, uh, because we're, we're uh, taking action on the basis of imperfect information, um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, open, opens us up in a different area. So I'm just kind of setting that up as a straw man just to, to try to illustrate the fact that these five areas of risk are not, are not discrete. And actually what people are doing is making judgments all the time, or should be doing, is making judgments all the time about the way in which risk in one area uh, uh, and risk in another needs to be balanced for, for us as an organisation. And, um, and the fact that this all comes out, at, so what troubles me about this is the fact that this all comes out as low risk actually implies that, that we're quite, um, uh, that we are as an organisation naturally quite risk averse. And of course, regulators are, but actually there are occasions on which we should be prepared to take risk on behalf of the public. And I, I just feel that, that, that we're, we're missing that and the interaction between these different areas of risk. And uh, just before I, I, I give way to the colleague on my left, <laughs> uh, uh, one, one other um, uh, uh, thought which um, I, just from the conversation we had last night um, which I thought was um, uh, really really important is uh, was the point that David Fish made actually that um, that in relation to new models of uh, service delivery and new models of regulation where again uh, uh, we we have less perfect information um, and far less history 
we will have to be prepared to operate um, uh, with a different risk uh, appetite. I know you haven't used that word, but anyway, the, we, we will have to... We, so so there's, there's something for the day job, but maybe something slightly different when we're dealing with innovation. And I... So, so, so I can't... I can't argue with the, spe with, the little, with the bits of each of this paper. If I go through it, in each area, each bit seems right. But adding it up and thinking to myself, and what do people do with this? How will someone making a decision in the front line of our operation make, this, make sense of this? And what will they take away from it? And I, I fear that they will take away from this uh, uh, low risk, risk aversion. And that's probably not quite where we want to be. Uh, thank you. Anna, the, the, the uh, ACGC, the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee, did look at this. And actually, you, you'd be very happy to know, we brought out the same point on, on being on risk in relation to us standing up and saying what we thought was right. Mm. Uh, I think the way it's got put into this, which is under the public confidence risk, is perhaps not the wording isn't quite fulfilling that. It's, it, we were saying we need to be we need to be prepared to be risky in terms of standing up, and I think I think it's just the wording in the second half of the public confidence risk that might need a little bit of tweaking to to bring that out. It kind of goes into double negatives almost mm -hmm. in there, in a sense. But uh, reinforcing what you were saying with making sure that when our people um, read this or it's brought to the you know, which hopes they will do uh, that they are clear about us being prepared to take risk in that respect. Um, and, and, and I think then the second bit would be just around uh, bringing up this, this in, in relation to innovation specifically, that we may need to take more, more risk in that, but that we will only take it in limited areas, I think is probably the way, way it's going. We're not prepared to see the whole thing mm -hmm. overturned in an innovative way without speaking out of it. Yeah, and that's uh, so. I, th I think it's just a, a matter of getting the wording a little bit better in that respect. I mean, the, the future, or well, the past and future of, of medicine has all been around taking risks. Yes. <laughs> we wouldn't have robotic surgery if the first one didn't take a risk. Mm. Anyway. Well, did you get, have you got I, I, I did. I, th I just want to reply. I think the key point that's coming through there is that we may, we need to be much clearer about how we will deliberately, thoughtfully take risk yes. in order to do things that preserve the public confidence, exactly. the act of that. Exactly. Um, and, that, and I agree that hasn't come out from that, so we will reflect that. And I think Paul's point earlier about innovation is on the edge of this, and therefore we're going to have to prepare to take risk around that. There's, so there's two dimensions, I think, that's being pulled out by the comments that need to go in that public confidence risk. I think it's only two sentences. Can I just say, I, Paul, I think this is a very good uh, explanation of risk because it's kept very simple and it's very readable and not many organisations I think are capable of doing that so I, I think this is a good statement on risk which people can follow. Okay. Any, any other comments? Any other comments? Are we, can we move on? Right, thank you. Um, so, sorry David, can I, can I just mm. be precise about this? So uh, I think what we're saying is that is now the organisation's business plan agreed I think the amendments that have helpfully come out on these issues around risk and uh, appetite tolerance and uh, the preparedness for risk are there. And, and, Jennifer, and Jennifer's point on the introduction. On the introduction, yeah, and I'll draft that, that in yeah, uh, that. Um, today. Um, and um, I just want, can I just land the issue though about um, the revisions to shape in the future? Because the shape in the future document is embedded within the business plan. Uh, our ambition was to get this business plan out this week before PERDA so that we begin the year having set out what our priorities are. So can I just tease out, David, that what we'll do is um, we'll do quick changes to the shape in the future content of the business plan uh, and we'll work more fully on the business plan. Uh, sorry, on the shape in the future document, but I, I am keen to get this business plan out at the beginning of the year for both our staff and our partners so they're clear about what our priorities are and how we take it forward. In, in uh, the past two days, we've had a couple of feedback from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, uh, a, a bunch of other 
stakeholders and colleagues uh, want us. So, um, Standing Commission on Carers say we don't mention carers. Um, I haven't checked it, but I suspect they're right. I suspect they've been through it with a fine tooth comb. I think we should say uh, family. Uh, patients, people who use services and carers. So I think that's a good challenge and I think we need to accommodate that. But with those last minute changes over the next 24 hours, uh, are we good to go? That's what no, I'm I think keen we're to good get. to go in the Shaping the Future document with the okay. changes that we've, we've with the okay. discussion. Yeah. We can reflect the points that have been made in the Shaping the Future. In the way you can do in 24 hours, yeah. be clear about the signals, be clear about the. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it's pretty high level, the Shaping the Future thing, anyway. So I th I'm sure we can do that. I th okay. So I think we're fine on both documents. All right, I just wanted to be clear. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Um, Sally, you've come. Your timing is immaculate. Why not? Um, uh, Andrew, you wanted to introduce this, I think. Um, thank you very much. Um, so what you've got in front of you is the um, uh, guidance, uh, uh, for, for provider guidance for the implementation of the market oversight regime, which is a new responsibility which um, the Care Quality Commission will have on the 6th of April this year. And um, we have, as has been set out in the paper, been developing uh, the guidance and the way that we're going to implement this new um, responsibility uh, through a series of co-production workshops, um, uh, running a, a working group originally um, with the Department of Health and then subsequently uh, uh, by ourselves, but working with providers, uh, with commissioners um, and with uh, lenders as well. So a lot of work has gone in to shape um, the design of the guidance and we also put it out for consultation. Um, I'm going to ask Sally just to highlight um, two or three key points uh, in, the, in the, the draft guidance as we've got here today for you to approve, um, uh, just in terms of the, the key points that have come back from the consultation that we've taken into consideration and a further issue that we've been sort of dealing with um, over the last week. But what I wanted to do before I handed over to Sally was just to pay tribute to her personally um, for the work that she's done in leading this, um, which has been um, which has been exceptional um, and has been recognised by um, people who have been working with us. Um, but also to say thank you to everybody who's been involved in the co-production, um, uh, providers, trade associations and others, and Ray James in particular from the Association and Director of Adult Social Services, um, who fortunately will be president um, uh, from next month um, and will be a very strong advocate for the work that we've done on market oversight. So um, hopefully she's recovered her blushes and can now um, uh, address the few points that we wanted to make. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, yes, yeah, so I was just going to highlight uh, a few key points. So the first is to remind people about the purpose of the oversight scheme, um, which is really about being able to assess the financial risk in the most difficult to replace adult social care providers. Um, and we assess that risk and assess whether people are likely to fail to be able to give local authorities early warning to be able to plan um, anything they would need to do to make sure people continue uh, to receive the care they need. So it's really important that we see the market oversight scheme and the local authority duty around continuity of care really as two sides of the same coin. So it's us giving the information to the local authority that means people who use services see the benefit of the market oversight scheme. So that's the, the, the first key point. The second key point to say is that providers who are in the market oversight scheme are not at any greater risk of failure than any other provider. It's merely that they meet the criteria to say that they are difficult to replace. And obviously in all of our public communications, we need to be very clear with people that that's the case so we don't cause undue alarm and, and concern people that, that just because providers are large may mean that they will fail. Um, the, the provider guidance sets out a six-stage approach to the operating model, and that has been tested and well-received through um, our co-production and our consultation events. Um, the consultation period with the draft guidance was broadly very supportive of the guidance. People thought it was an appropriate approach. Um, they said that, obviously, as we implement it, we need to make sure that we... Uh, reflect and learn on our experience of implementation and don't be scared if we need to change things as, as we learn more and as the market changes, but people thought it was the right approach. Um, there were a number of comments, particularly from members of the public, um, about the, um, if you like, the legal breadth of the scheme. And actually, I think members of the public would prefer that we were looking at more providers than just the, the, the larger schemes. And that feedback we're providing to the Department of Health. Um, uh, but obviously, we're, we're uh, delivering within the, the legal requirements of the scheme. 
Um, so all in all, it was a, a, a very positive set of, of, of comments about the draft guidance. Um, one of the key areas we have been further reflecting on since we shared a draft with the board um, last week um, is around the section, it's pages 33 and pages 34 on uh, roles and responsibilities in the event of business failure. Um, and what we've reflected on having worked, talked to the working group last week is that that section actually underplayed that the primary responsibility for making sure people are communicating well with people who use services with the staff, that primarily sits with the provider who is experiencing a business failure event and with the local authority who is needing to ensure continuity of care. We felt we were underplaying the primary responsibility sitting with them and kind of overplaying, therefore, the, the role of the national parties, where clearly the CQC, DH, ADAS and the Local Government Association all do have a role to help support and facilitate those two, two key players to be able to deliver that effective communication and, and ensure people have a minimal impact. But actually, we felt that we've kind of got the nuance slightly wrong. So we've made a, a few tweaks just to re-emphasise where the primary responsibility sits and be clearer <laughs> about our role in supporting um, the provider and the local authority. So that's the main change. Um, so as Andrea says, today we're seeking approval for the provider um, guidance to be published next week. And alongside that, we would publish the summary of what we heard in the call for uh, comments on the draft guidance and how we've responded to it. We also, in the cover paper, just um, remind the board about the governance arrangements around market oversight, where we have the scheme of delegation has been updated to include the legal decisions we're required to make. Um, we will create um, an advisory group, uh, which Paul from the Paul Roof and the board will sit on, and obviously the board will receive regular um, updates about how we are um, implementing our approach. So you can scrutinise us as well. Before we open it up, could you bear in mind this is a public meeting, but could you just, um, as far as you can, just say how we're going to cover the interim arrangements between over the next sort of three months before we've done our rec internal recruitment Absolutely. and where we are with our internal team. Okay. I know you can't mention names probably yes. at the moment, but just, just to give some okay, flavour to them. Yes. Um, so we are in the process of recruiting to the more senior posts within the, the market oversight and corporate provider team. So we have, um, we've interviewed for the director of corporate providers and market oversight, and we're just going through final due diligence on that before we can confirm um, who's taken up that post. Um, and we should be able to confirm that within the next week. Um, and in April, we will be interviewing for the two heads of market oversight. Um, so that will mean we will have in the organisation people who have got significant experience of financial risk of working in restructuring environments so really bringing a very different experience to what we have in CQC and an experience that's really critical to us operating the um, the model here because as we've worked with providers and lenders over the last six or nine months they've said you've absolutely got the right approach but this isn't a science it's an art this requires judgment it requires experience to know when to act and when not to act so they were really emphasizing the importance of bringing skilled people in-house so we're doing that in terms of bringing the team in. What we're also doing to make sure that we're ready to go on the 6th of April is we're currently um, out to a procurement to have an interim arrangement where we will have some um, consultancy support to help us do our initial risk assessments of the providers, um, and we will be appointing that contract next week to be ready to go in April. Um, and the other thing just to mm. say is that we've already got in, in train the arrangements that we need to make and deliver in the first week of April from um, uh, we get the responsibilities on the 6th uh, and uh, Sally has got her um, right hand um, ready and primed to sign several um, uh, letters um, to all of the providers to notify them that they're in the scheme to set up the arrangements for their first submission of, of information. So you know, we are absolutely ready to to um, move this forward um, in a very fleet of foot way as soon as we've got the responsibility. Um, any, any questions for Sally? Um, Paul, I don't know if you want to make a, some of your reflections. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think, um, I think there's something very interesting that we've heard, um, which is a, 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 a private sector market is welcoming oversight. Um, uh, and we need to reflect on why this is unusual. And of course, it's partly the skill that Andrew and Sally have shown in engaging with them. But actually, the reason they want market oversight is they're very, very anxious about this market. Um, and that whilst we are, uh, we are looking at individual, uh, uh, the largest organisations to see 
uh, where they are. Uh, uh, the purpose of this is to ensure some sort of continuity of care if something was to go wrong. If the entire market goes, there is a different situation. Um, uh, rather, so in a sense, if, if several local authorities lose their major providers, then obviously the thing would be due to restructure the market so that others will come in. Uh, but that people, people could leave the market full stop. Um, and then we're confronted with the real result of this is, um, is how, do we, how, how are then services provided? Um, and I think, so I think there's a jitteriness, a genuine jitteriness in the market uh, about how this, uh, how this market will continue uh, because there are several things that could change the nature of the market, um, uh, the market making money. Um, uh, interest rates could go up, uh, the minimum wage could go up, Property prices could go up, uh, which means that if you've got a residential home, you've got an alternative way of dealing with it. And all three of those things could well happen. And then the amount of money that's going in, fee in fees could go down. I think the likelihood of those four things happening are quite high. Um, if they all happen at once, then I think the market as a whole is in a problem. Now, that's not our responsibility, but it will be pretty near our lap mm -hmm. uh, when it happens, if it happens. Um, uh, uh, and I think we just need a, a breadth of that, which is not what, in a sense, the job of this piece of work is, but it is somebody's job. Um, uh, and we'll be near that job as that happens. And you'll ha we will have, because um, of what Andrew and Sally have done, we'll have you know, some of the best expertise around looking at that and making those judgments, but the judgment could end up with something much bigger than we think we're going to be dealing with. <coughs> A small addendum to that, and uh, it is not that. Uh, sorry, I think this is an excellent document, by the way. Um, is not that um, uh, 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 any of these organisations actually fail. It's just that they make a strategic choice to exit the market before they're anywhere near failure. And I'm sure you must have discussed, covered that in your discussions. But in a sense, that's out with our scrutiny, presumably. In one sense, yes, it is, but in another sense, we will have much better information and understanding about what is happening in the market in terms of the decisions that lenders are making um, and the way that providers are responding to that. And, and the, 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 the other thing to say is that we are linking uh, through this uh, market oversight regime, and the reason why this responsibility sits with CQC and nobody else is linking the assessment of quality with what the financial sustainability of the uh, individual enterprises and therefore the impact on continuity of care. So I think to come to both of your points, we are going to have a much, much better understanding of what's going on and that forward look, um, which uh, kind of feeds into all of the work that um, Paul and his colleagues have been doing about you know, what is our role um, as the regulator in terms of shaping the future and replaying back some of the um, insight that we are going to get in a sensible and proportionate way, um, which will help to influence some of the debates that are going on. And I think that you're right, Paul. That's one of the reasons why uh, the providers despite the fact that you know, we're asking them for more information and we're going to kind of be kind of you know checking up on them on every quarterly uh, every quarter asking them for financial information that they've not had to provide um, to us before all of those things are additional they are welcoming that because i think that they can see some benefit in that getting replayed back in things like our state of care report and and those sorts of things as well um, Sally, I think you've done a fantastic job. I mean, it's it's been really difficult to do. You've done it brilliantly. Um, I think the point that Paul makes is something that over the summer we need to do a lot of work on. We need to get this new person in, in post as well with help. But I mean, I detect this from all the big all the big providers with a large chunk of local authority funded residential care business and domiciliary care business are feeling very vulnerable. And and I think the point that Jennifer makes is right. They may try actually making strategic it's, it's not easy for them. You just I think in domiciliary care you just stop providing. You don't sell it to somebody else. You just stop providing. You don't go bust or you don't get into a real you just stop. You just don't quote for the next tender that comes out. They're doing it now. Mm. Yeah. So we we'll come back to this in the summer, but in the meantime, 
Thank you very much. Will you let us let the board know when we've put out what we ordered that procurement contract next week, and when we've got the um, references sorted out on the candidate that's been interviewed? Will you let people know then his background? I'll brief you this afternoon. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Um, next item. Um, Paul, is it? Yeah, it's very quick, I think. Yes, so this is the um, report from NIGC. So just very, very briefly to remind our colleagues, we, uh, the National Innovation Governance Committee was set up with a roughly two-year time, uh, time horizon back, uh, as part of the 2012 Act, uh, starting in April 2013, um, and it's uh, to help and uh, provide advice in our in response to our new, uh, our new functions on monitoring uh, seeking to improve registered providers' information governance practices. Um, formally, therefore, the, uh, the, um, the committee could end on the 31st of March. Uh, one of the commitments that the board has agreed in the past is for the committee to do a final report. It's already done an interim report. Um, that's not complete yet. The, um, the fault is not the fault, uh, out of the committee. Uh, it's a question of um, we haven't got off to... Uh, the best start in some of the analysis we wanted to do um, as a result of staffing issues we've, uh, we're bringing somebody new in to now do that um, so we asked the board to um, agree to extend the review date of the committee to the end of July um, and to note the minutes attached um, and the fundamental the question of um, what would happen after um, the 31st of July in regards to this committee uh, is bound up in where, what is the best way in which to seek advice on, uh, on monitoring IG practices Uh, well, and thank you to all the members of the committee and John Carvel, particularly, for deputy chairing it. I think Steve's going to take this one. Yeah, thank you. This is to, to seek endorsement for the um, provider handbook for uh, health and justice, which includes uh, social care now in, uh, in prisons as well from April. Um, this is an example of uh, co-production internally across directorates, but also... Um, with uh, HMI prisons and uh, we have a very good uh, working relationship with uh, uh, HMI prisons, Nick Hardwick and, uh, and his team. Uh, very briefly, this is um, an important document because we have over 85,000 people in prisons and uh, more in, uh, to add to that number, in youth, youth offender institutions and immigration removal centres. Uh, many are the most vulnerable in our society uh, who go in and out of prison and as we heard earlier on uh, we also have a, a role on um, inequalities and uh, looking at homelessness and many people come in and out of prisons and while they're in prison are extremely vulnerable. We've been inspecting uh, these institutions for some time and what this does is puts forward a, a new joined up approach uh, with HMI prisons, and um, the uh, detail is in the document. Thanks. Uh, I think it's a very good document. Uh, I just want to um, check. I'm sorry I've raised this point before, but I just want to absolutely check that we are talking about the health as well as the health care of people in custodial settings. And I say that because, it, in a way, it's sort of an analogous point to, I think, what the point Kay was making earlier about unmet need, because some of the, the health um, problems that face people in, in custody um, doesn't get, you know, one of the problems is they don't go to the provider. Um, so they don't get access to the screening that they might do. Um, uh, to take the obvious example of prison suicides, many of them are not under the care planning approach uh, about half, in fact, are not under the care planning that uh, is meant to protect people who are at risk of suicide. So there's an important point here about the, the health of, the, of, pe of people in that setting um, and not just what the providers themselves are doing. Um, that, that's an extremely good point, and uh, it's not just health in the round, it's also social care now because of the uh, Care Act, which puts duties on local authorities as well. So this is uh, going to involve, because of the multitude of providers, uh, uh, colleagues from Mike and um, Andrea's directorates as well, but yeah, very much health in its broadest sense. Is that explicit? I suppose I, I, I looked for it in the document and I, it sort of was 
suggesting it, but I wasn't 100% certain. Um, and, uh, I thought it was explicit, oh, but <laughs> if it's not, then uh, you, you are an expert, then uh, as part of this consultation, we can beef it up a bit then. But yes, that's the intention, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my um, question is quite a, a specific one, but I wondered um, what your thinking was on, on using um, experts by experience, because um, the, the ethos of that is, is that it's people with personal or lived experience. Um, and I, I can see that there could be sort of potential challenges um, about recruiting people who've um, had personal experiences of, of this kind of detention. For example, obviously, people who, who've been in prison will have a criminal record, obviously. Um, but I'm also mindful that, um, you know, some years ago, it was felt that you couldn't involve people with personal experiences of uh, detention under the Mental Health Act, and, and we've shown that that's, that just simply isn't the case. So I just wondered, um, are, are we able to um, embody the same ethos around lived experience in, with this group as, as we are um, other groups of people? Uh, it, is, um, it is tricky, but there is a section in here uh, looking at planning the inspection, the inspection, which uh, also involves um, discussions with uh, befriending services and advocacy groups as well. So. Um, uh, the question is how we then take that forward. So we'll we'll, we'll take your uh, thoughts. And if oh, it was we can meet outside. Yeah, as it was well. particularly about whether we can actually recruit some experts by experience um, who who have actually been through the prison system and could actually help us with with sort of insights um, as part of the inspection process. Yeah, thanks. I'll ta I'll take that back uh, to the team. Um, it's tricky. Um, what we can also say, though, is so far recruitment to the teams has been exceptionally good. A lot of interest, a lot of high quality people. So um, we'll take that back. Thanks. Sorry, um, a little, I suppose, a little advertorial, really, which is to say that um, there are some local health watch who've been working exactly in this space. Um, and I don't know how much you've been in touch with them, but it seems to me this is, a, this is um, an area where um, it'd be really, it might be really helpful to get um, those local health watch who, who are working in this uh, broad area together with uh, colleagues um, to talk about how they could input because um, they won't cover all the institutions that are affected, but some of them have, um, have uh, got some very... I, mean, I, I was talking to one local health watch uh, uh, on Monday who've got some intelligence, which I think it, it could be really helpful in this in this area. There's another local health watch that's been doing enter and view in prisons. So, so there's a, there's a there's a kind of a, a, an experience which we should make sure we draw on as a collective. My point's been answered. It was more about the um, the fact this is obviously a very vulnerable group, different cultures, different languages a lot mentally ill actually particularly in prisons just to make sure that our um, obtaining the views i guess that's what we were just just, just discussing but it it, it um, maybe a, a couple more sentences on that it didn't seem to come out the the fact that we're really going to bend over backwards to try and understand <coughs> these individuals and hear their views because many of them will be very frightened yeah. particularly in immigration centers yeah those are very important points and certainly it's the view of the Chief Inspector of Prisons, Nick uh, Hardwick, that uh, that's really crucial as well. So it's not, there isn't any opposition to that. We'll, we'll bring that out a bit more, yeah. Um, well, on, on, on a similar theme, the, I, I think we're being asked to, as it were, approve the co proposition that we don't rate. Uh, and um, I, can, I, I approve it in the sense of it going out to consultation. But... Mm. We are dealing with not only an extremely vulnerable group of people, mm. but it, a group which has uh, uh, much less access to choice by, by definition than, than any other group. So they have to take the service they get. They can't walk down the road to another general practice or, or whatever. And the commissioning process is completely different and, and, and so on. Mm. So I, I'm concerned to know, and we're not necessarily now, if we're not going to have ratings, and I understand the issues around that, what we have instead of that, uh, which actually makes it absolutely clear that the, the rights of individuals in detention settings um, to health care is exactly the same as the rights to, of anyone else 
in, in the outside world. And I just wonder whether the documentation we have here is sufficiently clear about our purpose in that regard. Yeah, thanks. It reads as we're not doing something rather than what we're doing, doesn't it? And um, it, it, we just feel it's going to be extremely difficult because of the multitude of providers, the multitude of sites to provide a rating on a service which crosses boundaries sometimes in and out of the centres. Um, uh, the answer to the exam question would be it's in the writing of the report and the enforcement action we would take. Uh, and even though you know, it's a prison, we wouldn't act any differently to whether it was a care home or a surgery. But I think we do need to be more explicit. So that's, that's very helpful. So when we rate, we rate trust. Um, I think I'm right, is all the healthcare provided services are delivered by a trust who are separately rated. So the rating applies to the trust rather than to the individual service. So trust X, Y, or Z that provides mm. services in prison A, B, and C, those trusts will be rated. Um, so it's not that there's no rating in relation to mm. these services. It's it, just we're not rating the service yeah. that's actually in this particular prison or this particular yeah. immigration it, removal. That's that, you're right. That's the bulk of it. But it's more complex than that. So if you go to say Le Leicester Prison, part of the substance misuse care is from the outstanding practice we rated in, which is a social enterprise in Leicester. But we weren't actually rating that part of the social enterprises uh, service either. So, so in fact, you're, you're absolutely right, David, but it's even more complicated than that as well. But, but we'll look at whether there's a way of, of doing that. But it's very difficult, absolutely. Could be three trusts in one prison providing different elements of care. It's actually a bit of an echo, isn't it, of the conversation we've been having about new pathways of, of care and so on, but, but the, in a very, one might say, extreme setting. And um, if, if there is a problem in joining up the dots between the various services which are providing um, yeah. health care in, in, in an institution, then that surely is something, a space in which we need to be. And I, I absolutely understand why ratings may not be of enormous assistance, if only because the choices of what to do about that are pretty limited. But um, we do need, I would have thought, to explore some means of signifying yeah. in a comparable way uh, what's good and what's bad, and hopefully yeah. what's outstanding, although yeah. Nick Harbert's experience would suggest there's not a huge amount of that about. Um, so just my final point, if nobody else. Uh, you're absolutely right, and you're ahead of the curve on that, because the group we're setting up to look at uh, the way forward, integrated care, vanguards and whatever, will have the um, uh, person in our team who's responsible for health and justice as part of that group, specifically because we can learn lessons from what they're doing because they're ahead of. And if you can do what you're suggesting, Robert, in this environment, you could quite easily do it elsewhere. So we, we, yesterday at the executive team, we added uh, Nigel Thompson to the team so that we can get an early view of that. Sorry, just, uh, uh, just to mark a, a, an issue. If I heard you right, Steve. What you said was that in relation to the practices that were delivering these services, for example, that we actually are rating them um, by location, not by institution. Um, so your work, the, the work that when you go to see them as a GP practice, you're uh, uh, looking at what the services they deliver in that location, but you're not looking at the services that they're contracted to provide in other locations, i.e. the services, in, for instance, in a prison or an IRC, which means the rating that we're giving them is, uh, is, is, is limited. If that's right, if I've understood you right, uh, uh, correctly, it means the rating is limited. It's different from the way that we do things. No problem with that. I mean, things have to yeah. be different in different, different sectors, but that's different from the way that we do things, yeah. for instance, in hospitals. But it's quite a big issue, mm. um, uh, it seems to me, in a world where <coughs> more and more services are likely to be contracted yeah. to current providers. Um, and uh, uh, and there's, there's a question yeah. then about um, how, how we handle, handle that in... It's Future space. So, so have, the, have I understood you rightly? Yes, you, you have. It is very confusing, isn't it? One of the problems in primary medical services at the moment is, uh, for example, again, in the same city, we went into a surgery the other day which had registered three um, 
different sites to provide services with us, whereas in the next town, uh, they might be classified as part of a branch surgery or another surgery to an over a, a larger group. And so we need to do some work with our registration teams and with the providers so that we have more clarity in what the provider actually is. And that's another stream of work we're working with uh, Adrian and um, Andrea's team on specifically. It can be very confusing and we need to clarify that. And it's getting more confusing as new provider types are merging and, and growing. Yeah, and I just wanted to be clear, when you drew the distinction with, say, the acute process, um, a, a trust could have many, many locations that we are, that say, an outpatient service at a local community hospital that we wouldn't uh, inspect or directly rate. So it's not, it's not the case that in the, in the acute sector, in de facto, we're going to every location that they are providing services from just to give, give a, co a confidence that there's not an inconsistency that doesn't need to be there. I think just to add to that, what we would normally do is we would go into those services that we have defined as core. But so, for example, when we went into uh, UCLH a, a year ago, we there was a whole hospital called Queen Square that we didn't go into because um, that that was a, a specialist uh, facility. Now we can decide whether we do that as an addition, but we won't necessarily go into each location of each hospital. Um, and in the Bart's Health um, recent inspection, we inspected all three acute sites. Uh, so we've done Wits Cross, we've done Newham, we've done Royal London, but we're not Mile End, not uh, the London Chest, or not not actually the Bart site. <laughs> Simple. You reflect those in the in the document. Yeah. These points. No, I think the points yeah. have been really helpful. Yeah, and that's why you. we have a discussion here, yeah. which is which okay. is good. Okay. Thanks. Right, thank you. Um, All special measures. So um, special measures has been in operation for um, uh, the trust sector for some time, and we've been piloting it in the primary medical services uh, sector um, at least since Christmas, maybe slightly before, October. October. Um, it would go live in adult social care from the 1st of, um, of April. Uh, this board paper is, is there to kind of give, give the overview of the approach across all sectors. The commonality of special measures is the, in its ability to provide a very clear timescale over which um, inadequacy needs to be put right. Um, uh, and it is, uh, as a result of that, it's very linked to ratings, um, as, the, as the paper sets out. That does not mean special measures is the same in every sector. If you are a, a care home entering special measures, uh, you're not able to draw upon any formal support in the way that you absolutely are if, uh, if you are an acute trust or mental health trust going into special measures, and there is also some support for um, primary medical services if they, if they choose to take it. Um, so there are also real differences. Um, there's also differences of scale um, in, our, in our different uh, sectors, um, and so it's appropriate there's a difference of timelines, which is why we have an 18-month timeline for um, the trusts, uh, but a 12-month timeline uh, for all others. Um, what we are trying to then set out in here is basically the entry and exit criteria. Um, uh, if I sort of briefly run through those, any provider after the 1st of April who is um, overall inadequate, rated as overall inadequate, um, would be looking at uh, special measures straight away with a further inspection within six months um, to test if they, if they had made sufficient improvement. Um, we also have a sort of second route into special measures uh, because what we know is what can happen, one element of care can improve but another go down. So to give an example, if a, if a care home were found to be uh, inadequate on safety um, but then able to improve within uh, the six months but we found to be inadequate on caring, we would still place them in special measures, equally so an independent health care provider or primary medical services. Um, because we, we, we can't tolerate those that bumping along at the bottom. Um, the two checkpoints, if you like, and I'll, I'll deal particularly with the um, adult social care and independent health care paramedical services, um, are with the first is within six months and the second is in within 12 months. I, I'm dwelling on that point because in 5.17 we say 
in six months. I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that the inspection will always be at the six-month point for the clarity of the board and for the, sort of the minutes it will be within six months. Um, we're looking for sufficient improvement. That doesn't mean that everything has to be uniformly good. These things take time to turn round, but we are looking for an absence of any inadequate ratings at an aggregated level, so either a key question level um, or core service level or population group. Um, if we don't see that um, within the six-month horizon, uh, we move to the um, taking further action, including um, uh, starting proceedings to cancel the registration or vary the registration, um, and we come back in within another six months. And if we still haven't seen the improvement uh, that we need to, uh, then we complete that process with the act of uh, preventing that particular providing from providing those services at that location. Um, that's the heart of this uh, the, uh, of this process. Any any comments, <laughs> Robert? Um, I, I'm this is probably no all in favour of uh, doing this sort of stuff as quickly as possible. But um, the, twelve months is that always a practicable proposition? I mean, it might be to turn around a place in relation to say effectiveness as opposed to safety. Safety maybe there's a higher or rather a lower threshold of tolerance than in relation to other things, but is 12 months always going to be realistic in relation to, say, a large organisation? So if it was a large organisation like a trust, and then, then it's an 18-month process rather than a 12-month process. Um, I think we need to be really clear that we are not expecting everything to be put right. What we're expecting is that the inadequate... Uh, care is, is no longer there, so that it basically comes down to we expect there to be at the level of requires improvement. We took a lot of time over consultation um, in 2014 to make sure we were right about the thresholds that we were setting for inadequacy and requires improvement. Uh, I think the judgment and having uh, been through an engagement exercise on this is that it is credible to expect people to improve to the level set out of requires improvement. And also, for, you know, part of us walking the talk of being on the side of people using services is that otherwise it's another six months or 12 months of appalling care, and you know, as, you, as you've highlighted in your, in your reports, Robert. Um, I should have said also that we, this, is, this, this is a framework that we, that we use alongside our formal enforcement policy. If we need to take urgent action to protect people from harm, as uh, all our sectors are doing, uh, Andrew has given particular updates to the board in the past, we will absolutely do that. We don't have to wait six months, 12 months. If action needs to be taken, we can take it urgently. Can I just, as I say, I repeat that I'm not wishing in any way to encourage us to, to sort of hold, hold back where we need to take action, but is, it, 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 maybe it's a legal matter, but is there any issue around this sort of timeline in terms of whether or not someone could challenge it for being arbitrary? In other words, if there's no discretion that, you know, we must cl close you down at the end of a year because you've not satisfied these criteria. Do you see what I mean? Is, or is, is it still a matter of judgment at that stage? Um, so it is a matter of judgment. The legal test for whatever the enforcement action we were proposing to take would still have to be met. I think what the special measures... Um, does though is just give a bit of a policy wraparound to how we um, will move through um, use of our powers. So I think it's just a sort of public statement of this is the process and this is our approach. Within that, then you've got the different tests for different types of action. Sorry, it's on um, paragraph seven. Very good, by the way. Um, paragraph 7.2. Um, if um, Paul's Armageddon Sarah scenario occurs in social care um, with a lot of um, possible failure or and quality uh, dipping in the social care sector, maybe, uh, and also with the health indices being a financial squeeze in health in the next couple of years. So it's that modelling, which is, I know you say ongoing monitoring, but it it could get out of hand, couldn't it? Uh, and, and the follow-up burden on our inspection team's quite high, so it's just a, I guess it's just a pointer at that um, and to 
I don't mean, just one other sort of left field comment. Um, it just sort of raises in my mind the uh, question of um, the market oversight of health care facilities, which I presume is monitors in monitors bag. Um, so we have modelled in now that we have much more information on the emerging pictures in, in PMS and adult social care on um, uh, how many people are or proportions within uh, that are inadequate or requires improvement. So, for example, in, in, in Steve's area, 87% so far of rated practices are good or outstanding. So the um, the absolute quantum is is not enormous. It, it's higher. Um, uh, in, in adult social care, but still clearly a minority, so you wonder a, a practice of uh, care homes and DCAs being inadequate. Um, we had always modelled in to go back within six months um, of inadequacy, so we are, th that, that's part of this. Abs if, if, I think as you're saying to Paul's uh, point, if it gets worse and worse and worse, yes, absolutely. Um, but we also have got to have a sort of a prioritisation of uh, keeping people safe, so we would need to put more resource into checking where there were real concerns about care, and we would have to talk to the department and talk to the board about, about what that did for our overall ratings programme, but our best assessment is as set out in the business plan. So, um, Paul, the last one is dental care services. Is that you, Steve, is it? Dental care? Uh, well, one that, uh, there's two, two components to paper 11. There's the provider handbooks, uh, independent ambulances and, and independent acute, and then dentists. Although they, there, there is a link because the consultation response, rather than confuse everybody by having multiple consultation responses, also includes dentistry. Uh, but let me, um, let me start with the one that's, uh, that's titled Provider Handbooks, including ambulances and independent acute providers. Um, just to, to start with a, an apology, it says at the bottom of the final page, Appendix 4, response to consultation will be provided. It wasn't our intent to provide that to the board. It's just uh, uh, it should have been removed uh, because, as it says in the recommendation, uh, we would like to um, full documents to be signed off by the executive team with the board's agreement. So the, uh, the request is that the board agree the proposed approach to regulating ambulances and in, uh, separately independent uh, acute providers are set out in the slides and that we publish the associated documents, which is the conduct response. Um, uh, the acute handbook will be updated to include independent um, acute hospitals. Um, there will be a separate handbook for um, ambulances. And then we would also propose to update all our provider handbooks uh, to reflect the new regulations, including fundamental standards and uh, policy, including enforcement policy, uh, from April 2015. So there's quite a suite of, of documents that would come out uh, ahead of the 1st of April uh, if the board is content, but the policy position is set out in the, uh, in the slides in the covering paper. Mm. Any questions for Paul? Are we happy for that to go ahead? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I think that concludes the meeting. Sorry, dentist. Dentist. Yeah, I'm sorry, dentist. Sorry. Um, <laughs> dental sorry, Steve, is that you? <laughs> dentist? No, I tried, tried to do that. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> so, so, but very much a joint piece of work with, uh, with Steve and his colleagues. Um, so I think the only point is to highlight there is we have gone through quite a lot of consultation um, as part of having the draft provider handbook and working with the, um, the sector on this. Uh, we discussed at the board previously that we don't intend to rate in 2015-16 on dentistry. That is because of the, um, our, our assessment, the Department of Health's assessment, on the inherent level of risk in that sector, which has been borne out by our recent inspections. Uh, so this um, paper asks you to approve the policy position uh, and to delegate the sign-off of the handbook and the appendix, which is the key lines of inquiry, um, to, uh, to uh, the Chief Executive and Chair, all for publication at the end of this month. Steve, are you happy with them? Uh, we're very happy. A lot of work has gone on on this, and um, again, the co-production theme, very close working with uh, the dental regulator um, and the BDA. So, so actually, the feedback has been very positive. Excellent. Any any questions from the floor? Yeah. 
David. It's David. Oh. Oh. Um, I, in the last couple of weeks, had uh, occasion to put a recording device into somebody's room. He's somebody I take out very often. About 50% of the time, he complains. He says he wants to leave. He can't leave. Uh, he's got dementia. But the complaints are always about the same thing, that he's denied choice. He's told he's got to have a bath. And he feels like, I think we all do, that he'd like to be independent. So I, I put this in, uh, and I listened to it. And I, there were some things that I thought were unacceptable on it. Took it to social services. They agreed with me that it was unacceptable. So far, so good. Um, but then what I, as a member of the public, was looking for was that they would then say, um, <clears throat> these are what, this is what I, we're going to do. We're going to make sure that he's going to be content in his setting from now on. And going back to Sir Robert's point, that everybody else in the same setting is also going to be content, that you are not going to be stopped from going to visit him, that you can go on putting in this to monitor whether in the recording device to, so as to monitor that things are, are, are properly being, being done properly. And also because there was some good stuff on it, somebody caring for him very well, that that also would be brought to the attention of the management and that person would be recognized and recompensed. But I didn't get that. What I got was, is this a safeguarding event or is it a complaint? Um, all questions of process. Did he give approval? And if he did give approval, did he have capacity to give it approval? I came away with a feeling of disappointment and that things were going out of my control and that it, perhaps it wasn't really worth doing at all. My question to you is, had I brought it to the CQC instead, would I have got a different kind of response or would it have been better to go to the Daily Mail? <laughs> to address that. Oh, it's definitely Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of knew that one was coming my way. Thank you, David. Um, as you know, um, David, we have uh, published information uh, for the public about the use of uh, uh, surveillance techniques of, uh, of any type. And one of the things that we've been very clear about in that is, yes, of course, um, you could come to us and uh, we would um, uh, respond to you in an appropriate um, and proportionate way. And certainly it would fit the, the, the issues that you describe would fit with my expectation that it's the provider um, that is responsible for ensuring that there is person-centred, effective, responsive care, and that um, the uh, needs and wishes of the individuals under their care um, uh, are being responded to appropriately. And we would discuss and agree with you how we would approach that um, and how we would go back to the provider in a way that um, uh, would assist in the uh, uh, treatment and care of that individual. Um, it's not for us to kind of take that forward in a you know in terms of either resolving a specific complaint um, or anything like that, but it would be about making sure um, uh, that um, the uh, the service provider was actually providing appropriate care. So if you want to discuss it with me separately, then I can put you in touch with a relevant inspection um, manager and inspector. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Robin Pike from uh, Healthwatch Hertfordshire. Uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, one relates to listening to the patient voice, which has been a theme in the board meeting this morning. Uh, how do inspection teams ensure that the patient voices that they hear and listen to are representative? So that, for example, in inspecting a GP surgery, um, if inspectors speak to the patients who happen to have an appointment on a Monday morning, uh, to ensure that they are actually representative of the patient population, or for a hospital in a listening event, um, that the listening event is widely publicized within the hospital, and that the patients who uh, are listened to are representative. I can talk about that from a hospital perspective, certainly. Um, 
there's no doubt that the people who attend our listening events for the hospitals are not representative. Um, they are, tend to be at the two poles. Uh, there are those who are strongly supportive of a hospital and want us to hear how wonderful it is, and those who have had negative experiences. We expect that. Um, but it can also inform us about what we might want to look for. Um, and so uh, the neg I can think of one, uh, for example, where many of the negative experiences were about ophthalmology. That prompted us to go and look at ophthalmology. Uh, another where it was about vascular surgery. Um, so we went and looked at that. So th that isn't representative, and we won't effectively use it then to make a judgment. It'll, it'll help us to know where to go to. Um, we do, of course, talk to a lot of patients and relatives while we are going round the eight core services um, uh, we see. So we ask them directly about the care that they're currently receiving, and that's in the outpatient setting as well as in inpatient settings. Um, on top of that, of course, uh, to, we do get a more representative picture by looking at the CQC inpatient survey and by looking at surveys such as the A&E survey. So we then try to bring all of those together uh, what we see, what we hear, um, and the, the, the hard data to form judgments. It's not perfect, but it's the best we can do. Bren? Uh, could I uh, briefly just ask about the um, Barts Trust, which has been mentioned? Um, the first inspection did uh, report on all the sites, and uh, my question is particularly about the London Chest Hospital, uh, which was a subject of certain criticisms in the first report. Uh, London Chest Hospital has been, I think, in Bethnal Green for 150 years, and it's moving next week, I believe, onto the Barts site. Will it, in future, be treated as a separate hospital, or will it be subsumed within the Barts Hospital? Um, I, I think once it has moved, we, in planning any inspection, we will talk to uh, the Trust and get them to explain the services that they're providing. So I imagine that, that a lot of that will, for example, be thoracic surgery, um, and that will be uh, probably alongside the cardiac surgery that, that is, uh, is at, at Bart's, and we will then decide how best to assess those. And It won't necessarily be as a separate uh, entity, because it will by, probably by then be, be merged into the structures um, uh, on the Bart's site, but I would prefer to leave that until, until the moves happened, and then, but in planning we will always look at that. And the issues that were identified in the beginning will still be addressed. Oh yeah, yes. In we the will new come, location, we will come back to those issues. We will always go back to what our previous inspection report was, and so if the service is just because it's moved, we will read back to our previous report. Okay, thank you, um, Bren. Yes. <clears throat> A um, couple of things, really, in terms of following on from the um, listening events, funny enough, really. Last uh, month, I was at the board meeting, and the very next night, I was at one of the listening events um, in, in England, shall we say, is a good diplomatic reply. I think you need those multiple routes in, to be quite honest, Mike, really, which, which you've got, really. Um, I don't think it will be representative. I totally agree with you, really, but I think it will be an opportunity for CQC, again, to demonstrate the culture in which it wants to lead from, really, the culture of openness. Uh, when I went in, um, uh, warmly welcomed, uh, friendly people, uh, responsive listening, and that opportunity when you didn't want to say anything openly in public, uh, the, a room to go into to share those views. So what I looked at from there is what I heard and saw around the board and actually what your staff did on the ground. And that's the most important thing for me. And I hear so many times as judges on our, um, on our actions as well as our words, really. So I'd just like to feed that back in. Uh, David, you mentioned about those voices that are difficult to listen to and whatever, really. Um, you know, when you have those conversations after uh, a, a, a period which is, is, people um, have been very uncomfortable with is the best way to describe it. But they're always going to be difficult, really. They're always going to be very difficult. And I'm just wondering what 
what approaches we, we've got and we use to make sure those conversations are easier for the person, really. Um, someone said about bringing advocates and whatever, really. Um, but someone else said to me, actually, I'd just like to bring a friend along or whatever he is. Wow. So, um, you know, how, how we have, like, those difficult conversations in the environment which we create, which makes it sometimes a little bit easier. But we'll always have those difficult ones by the very nature of it's uh, a difficult situation. I completely agree with, with uh, David Beam in terms of the um, safeguarding the, and the commissioners and whatever, really, doing a little bit more. I sent on a report to Andrew, really, in terms of what I received in terms of that. And I read that report on safeguarding, um, uh, which, uh, which was given to me twice, to read how really appalling it was for the people and whatever, really. And I think that bit about the commissioners... Uh, doing a little bit more and whatever in terms of that more accountability is absolutely right and whatever, really. Mentioned about the, um, the uh, conversations around change. Um, Jan said to me the other day and whatever, really, a lady from, from Gloucestershire really said, the problem is that sometimes we don't have those early conversations with people before we then make those changes. And the reason why they fight tooth and nail for those services is because people have, haven't had those open, honest conversations at the very, very early stages, and that's why they get very defensive and whatever, really. Um, the last one I'd like to make, really, in terms of the comment that Mike made about um, the quality summit and one provider saying, you know, we've made more difference in four years on this, to me, that's quite sad. It is quite sad, really, and it's disappointing because it, 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 it offers a thought to me that there hasn't been a relationship there for four years and whatever, really. And behind that, relationships are those services that people get. So I think it's really good that the provider says that, but actually, really, I'm really disappointed that over that four-year period, that's the only opportunity it's been brought up and, and for, for, for CQC to be aware of it as well, really. So uh, just like to offer those, those thoughts and whatever. And I was really pleased today and I'm going to take this back and whatever and speak to some people, that I heard that, you know, the aspects around the inequalities mentioned again and, that, and there's people we're speaking to. But I still think we've got a lot more work to do. And we know that. It's the how bit, isn't it? How do we do it? Around the people we're not speaking to or they're not heard as well or not at all, really. Those are just my comments. Brian, thank you very much for that. If um, we can do half as well as you and Jan have done down in Gloucester, we'll be very happy. So thank you. Anyway, thank you very much again for, for your comments. Thank you. Right, we'll conclude.